drivers, start your engines. An all-new adventure begins with the new generation of supercars. Supercar season 2023. Come on, fire. We've had it all. 11 different race winners. And a new generation of stars. Wonderful Wisbergen. What a legacy he has left. Here comes the miracle man, SVG. Number one, 2016 begins. Shane Van Gisbergen takes victory at Mount Panorama. 2022 Repco Supercars champion, Shane Van Gisbergen. 250 kilometres remain in one of the best supercar seasons in history. It's time for the final race at the Velo Adelaide 500. Great to have you with us for the final race of the season. This has been an incredible stage on which to showcase the Supercars grand finale. The Adelaide 500, it is the hottest ticket in town. The circuit is rocking today for the final 250 kilometres of racing for the year. And it will be an epic victory lap for Brody Kostecki, who clinched the championship yesterday. His maiden title and he becomes just the 26th driver in history to do so. And he'll start from the pole position today. Hey, Brody, congratulations. Congratulations on becoming champion-elect. You'll get your hot little hands on that trophy at the end of this one. But a 10th pole position. Just talk to us about the emotion of starting this final race, the ultimate victory lap from P1. Yeah, it's pretty... Uh, yeah, I don't really think it's actually sunk in yet. I'm sure it will on the last lap. But, uh, yeah, I didn't get to sleep last night till about 11 o'clock. I was uh, thinking about how we could make the race car a bit better. We, uh, we weren't too good yesterday and it was texting back and forth with my engineer, George. So, yeah, stoked to be on pole again today. But, yeah, it'll be some hard work. We've got some fast cars behind us. But we'll do our best and uh, see if we can take away the team's championship as well. Yeah, you never, ever have a minute off. You're a hardcore racer. Are you confident the car is faster than yesterday? Have you made many changes? And what do you need to do to ensure that Coca-Cola Racing are in P1 in the pit lane next year? Well, I'll tell you one thing, Jason. It won't be from a lack of effort, that's for sure. Um, yeah, they had a mammoth job to fix car nine uh, last night. And, uh, you know, that was still still pulling my, my, my car apart, trying to make it faster again today. So just a big thank you to everyone at Coca-Cola Racing, powered by Erebus. It's been a big night for the boys, but, you know, we're, we're, we're looking forward to this last race and, and um, hopefully Will can come through as well and, and uh, finish off his last race, just, you know, strong for the team. Good luck, Brady. Go get him. I will do. This is an incredible event, and if you had to thank one man for it, it'd be this bloke, South Australian Premier Peter Malinowskis, who brought this event back to life last year. Premier, you look around here and you look at this crowd and sold-out grandstands and people hanging from the pit garages, you've got to be really proud. Uh, I'm just so wrapped with the support that we've got from around the country, Barretts. It's not just South Australians, a lot of people from interstate, even a lot of New Zealanders here as well, but all corporate completely sold out, every grandstand seat sold out today, so we're wrapped with how it's gone. You must be so proud because you know, to bring this event back was a big decision at the time and, and you've become such a sporting big event centre here in Adelaide. It has been a bit of a risk, but it's one that's paid off and the way the whole state and the whole country has got around it. And, and it gives us a chance to showcase a fair bit that's happening in South Australia at the moment. We're performing really well economically, so but I just want people to have a good time more than anything else. And I think there's been a fair share of that across the last couple of days. There's a lot to celebrate in South Australia at the moment. What's your long-term hope for this event? What do you want it to be? Well, I think we've really got the capacity to establish ourselves as the premier touring car event globally. Uh, that's what our ambition is. I think we're very much on track to that. Have a quarter million of people to come across four days is not a bad turnout. We've had international representation here, so uh, we're optimistic about its path to growth. We're investing in the infrastructure to make sure for patrons it's uh, worth visiting, and so it's almost an upwards. It's a great experience, isn't it? From the fans' point of view, you come yeah. here now, you enjoy this grandstand. For yeah. people who've been coming for years, they've got a roof on the grandstand, yeah. they can enjoy it. It's brilliant. Sometimes it's the little things that make a difference, Barretts. But if you want to be premier, if you want to be internationally a destination, you've got to be willing to invest in it. And infrastructure does make a difference. So a little thing like putting a roof over patrons' heads for, for rain or sun, that makes a difference. And we get a better yield out of ticket revenue anyway. So it's one of those things that pays off. Awesome, Premier, you've done a great job. Thanks. Enjoy it today. Enjoy your great work. Thanks. The driver's are ready to go. Everyone is set to get started. We cannot wait to get things underway. Everyone's standing now. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, for the national anthem. Australians, oh, let us rejoice, for we are one and free. 
With golden soil and wealth for toil, our home is good by sea. Our land abouts in nature's gifts of beauty, rich and rare. In history's page, let every stage advance Australia fair. In joyful strength, and let us sing, advance Australia Fair. Well, that is impressive, isn't it? Well, as we shape up for our last race of the season here, the championship's done, but there's so many cool subplots that I reckon are going to make today's race fantastic. Look at James Courtney coming up to wish his team well, or the team's well. But right here, Brody Kostek, he won the championship, but he didn't drive the way he loves to drive. He's aggressive, he likes to win from the front. He had to park the championship yesterday, put it in place. He's going to be way more aggressive today. That's going to be fantastic to watch. Right next to him, Matt Payne in this super-fast Mustang, young bloke. He wants to really... I guess stamp his authority with this team with Stanaway coming next year because Davey Reynolds is moving on. Really important that he does well. But come with me. Doesn't matter how far we go down the grid and where we do see if we can part the sea here. Have a go at this. This is pretty cool. Through we go. Through we go. Doesn't matter where we go. Excuse me, folks. There's a subplot here. Chas Mostert's car. So this is the very last race that Adam Debore, he's a long-time engineer, Chas Mostert's engineer is going to do with him. They will want to go out on a high. They will be hustling. Right next to him, Cam Waters. He's been the form in the Mustang, hasn't he? And the Mustang's really, if you're a Ford fan, trust me, I reckon this is going to be your day. So he's going to want to end the, the year on a high with, high with Tim Edwards leaving. That's really important, but we keep going. It doesn't matter how far we go down this grid, the subplots are everywhere. So... I don't think this is a race about one or two things. I reckon there's seven or eight different things. Tommy Randall, he finished on the podium yesterday. Again, great work. Next to him, you've got Young Feeney. He wants to stamp his authority before Will Brain lands there. I could keep going. Much more to the day than I've shown you here, so really tune in and enjoy it. It's going to be a great one. Final race of the year is always emotional, but this year we say farewell to a great champion in Shane Van Gisbergen, who steps off and goes to big things in the United States in NASCAR, but not without a special award from the fans. Now, the fans have voted Shane the most popular driver here is the fans' choice. Shane, congratulations, your trophy. Enjoy that. You go with all our great wishes to the US and have a fantastic time there, mate. Congratulations. Fantastic. Shane Van Gisbergen, the fans' choice award, most popular driver. What a way to step off. A lot of sunshine on the racetrack out there at the moment. It's actually the warmest conditions that we've had now since activity commenced on Thursday afternoon where it was a very wet beginning. Thomas Randall, boy, he's been strong this weekend, continuing the fine form that we saw at Tail and Bend earlier in the year with a pole position and three podiums on the podium yesterday. Jam-packed scene on the grid out there at the moment. Lots of sunlight, quite a lot of humidity also, Mark. Mm. So day two, another 250 k's. You start to feel that in the body when it gets a bit warmer. Certainly do. And it is a tough event, Neil. We've often said that it's the hardest one of the year physically. And if you make a little mistake, very, very big consequences we always speak of in the concrete canyon that is the Adelaide Street Circuit. Great to have the Premier down there. And what a great job they have done collectively, South Australian Motorsport Board and everyone committing to this event. And look at that coverage over the grandstand crop. It just looks fantastic, doesn't it? Very big investments been made here to bring the event back last year. Supercars in Adelaide since 1999 and you can see just how popular it is. An enormous crowd has built up for our ripping final race of our championship year. Matt Payne starts this one from the outside of the front row. The difference between starting on the inside for you, Matt, was three one thousandths of a second in the top ten shootout. You must be happy to be on the front row, but so close to getting your first pole. Yeah, we were uh, we were close there. I thought the lap wasn't too bad. Didn't really make too many mistakes, but um, yeah, just sort of slipped away a little bit. Happy to be on the front row, though. It's put us in a really good position to have a strong result this afternoon, and uh, yeah, see what see what I can do. 
Had a few dramas at turn three on the opening lap of yesterday's race, which put you deep down the field five laps behind. But if you kept an eye on the timing screen, your car was very, very fast over the course of the yesterday's race. Do you feel like you've got the car that you need to go and beat championship elect Brody Kostecki today? Yeah, I think we definitely can challenge. I think we had really good speed yesterday. Um, definitely giving it a bit of a tune up today. And um, yeah, I think we're, we're, we've got a good shot. Just need to get a good start and, and run a clean race. What's going to be the challenges? That to your first 250 Ks around here yesterday, you would have learnt a lot overnight. What are the challenges ahead for you today? Um, oh, it's, it's still about tyre dig, you know. We're on the softs this weekend. It's all about trying to be consistent over that over that stint. Um, the stints are pretty long, so it's, it's just about managing it at the start and then trying to have something to fight for at the end. So um, it's going to be all to play for today. I think Brody's going to race hard too, so it's, um, it's going to be a good show. Good luck. Looking forward to watching this one. Thank you. Todd Hazelwood, this is a big moment for you. It's the last race of the year, the last race with this team and potentially the last race in supercars for now. Uh, how are you feeling? Yeah, pretty mixed emotions, I guess. Uh, excited, front of the home crowd, uh, got representing Red Arc, you know, proud South Australian Cup neat, but yeah, as you said, my final event, full-time supercars. It's been a 10-year journey in supercars now, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to just try and finish this weekend on a high. We've got a fast car, we qualified well, and um, more than confident we can we can pass a few in the race as well if thing goes our way. So, fingers crossed we can uh, go out on a high. Yeah. Starting P8, just soak this one up and enjoy it. Yeah, we'll do. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Well, I'm here with a very proud uncle, Cam Waters. Hey, Grid 3, yesterday's race win. Um, how are you feeling ahead of this one today? Uh, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, better than starting eight, so had a pretty good lap in the shootout and, um, yeah, starting a little close to the front. So Carl's really good in, in the race yesterday. Looked after his tyres nicely. Hopefully we can do it again. Uh, yeah, see what happens. How's your mindset heading into the last one? Race 28 of 28. Do you change uh, your mentality or your approach to it or you just want to try and win? Just try and win, mate. Max attack and um, if we win, then awesome. If not, you know, we've, uh, we've had a dip and um, can't wait for a cold beer tonight. Yeah, physically, these races are pretty tough. Hey, 250 k's. How'd you pull up after yesterday and how do you prepare for this one? Yeah, I pulled up pretty good. Um, obviously, a little bit tired, but as soon as you get back in the car, the adrenaline kicks in and, and away you go. But how's Uncle Cam going to go, boys? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> All the best, mate. Thank you. Hopefully win. <laughs> So I've walked way down to the back of the grid, 25th position. Cam, hey, just quickly, Cam, give us a thumbs up. You OK? Feeling all right? That's the best news of all. See, he walloped that, that wall hard turn eight in qualifying, didn't he? We've seen that's consumed a lot of cars. I can't believe, I honestly can't believe these cars out here. They're a small team, a hard-working team, not a big budget team. They've put four corners. When we say corners, I mean all the suspension underneath this car on every corner, the wheels, the transaxle, which is like the different gearbox up the back, that had to be replaced. Panels had to be replaced. The whole front bar had to be replaced. The wing had to be completely remounted. All these mounts, you saw that get torn off. That's a big dollar. I couldn't give you a number. I reckon it'd be into the six figures. That's a big repair. But I say well done to these guys for getting this thing out on the grid. Really good. Thomas Randall on the podium yesterday. You start today's race out of sixth. Have you got what you need to get yourself back on the podium today? I hope so, Garth. It's, it's going to be a long race. It's going to be uh, warm out there and, you know, Adelaide's put on the beautiful sunshine this afternoon and so great to so, see so many people here and fingers crossed we can get the Castro Mustang up the front again. You know, it was such a special day for the team, double podium and so great to get a win as well for, for, well, for Cam and, yeah, he's starting in third, we're sixth, just got to get a nice start hopefully and just be great to end the year on a high, you know. I think everyone's going to be pushing pretty hard, so expect plenty of action. You mentioned your teammate Cam Waters. He had the win yesterday. He looked like he had very good tyre consistency over the duration of the stint. Your car drifted away a little bit the late in the stint. So have you learned a few tricks off Cam overnight to maybe use that today? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I probably don't know about the drifting part, you know, because uh, that's what Cam Block would like. But, um, yeah, we, we struggled a little bit in that last stint. And, you know, it was a pretty good gap to Chaz behind. So I didn't want to risk it too much. We're in such a great position. So... Fingers crossed we can have just that little bit better rear tyre life than we did yesterday. And, yeah, we'll see. It's, a, as I said, long race and anything can happen. Good luck, mate. Enjoy it. Thanks, Garth. Cheers. Will Brown just strapping in for the final time with Coca-Cola racing by Erebus, starting probably a little bit out of position than what you would have liked. But what's possible this afternoon, Will? Yeah, uh, we'll wait and see. Obviously, yesterday was really disappointing with what happened out there. And, um, yeah, it was disappointing that me and, uh, me and Shane crashed out. But, uh, 
hopefully a better race today. We'll just see what strategy we have and hopefully move forward. We have a faster car than 11th, uh, just didn't get the best running quality. Just physically, how are you feeling? It's been a tough day and obviously a very difficult crash for you yesterday. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. My hand was a bit sore, but that's fine. Just a little bit of whiplash, but no, nah, pretty, pretty good apart from that. All the best. Enjoy. Cheers. Thank you. It's all about to come to a roaring conclusion in 2023. This is Event 12, the Repco Supercars Championship, Velo Adelaide 500. We're in the Adelaide Parklands just to the east of the city, and that's the grid scene where Brody Kostecki, our champion elect, has the armor all pole position. It was an awesome shootout earlier in the day, and he's the man that's got the primary position, although he does it from the dirtiest side of the grid. Is that going to be a factor when he blasts down towards Turn 1? We're going to find the answer to that very shortly. This weekend, we're privileged to be in South Australia. You heard from the South Australian Premier just a few moments ago. An enormous investment in this racetrack facility right to the east of the city. Look how close it is to the CBD. If you need to do some retail therapy, it's a couple of hops, skips and jumps and you're in there. Or a beverage or a nice meal. And that's been one of the great attractions since Formula One came here back in 1985. 3.2 kilometres around here, thanks to Pizza Hut. 14 turns around the track, divided into three parts for the purpose of timing and understanding who's doing what in which sector and street circuit means there's concrete walls there's painted white lines there's manhole covers there's only a couple of runoff areas there's a lot of risk around this racetrack just ask cam hill he got it wrong at turn eight earlier in the day panasonic starting grid mark we've got 25 cars out there which is a great news story because cam hill is out there as larko pointed out a moment ago what a tremendous effort by everybody down there at truck assist and matt stone racing Cam Hill, on his birthday, had a massive shunt at turn eight. I thought for sure that car would not make it, but they're there and perfectly placed to get on with the final race of the year. Two Brad Jones racing cars there on the next group, just in front with Jack Smith and Macaulay Jones, then Mark Winterbottom and Bryce Forward. Just alongside the two South Australians there, Tim Slade and Scott Pye for Newlon and Toyota Forklifts. James Courtney, 18th, Nick Perk had his final drive both of those gentlemen, final drives for those organisations. Same with Shane Van Gisbergen. We just spoke to him on the grid there with Mark Beretta. Declan Fraser did a good job in qualifying and the two teammates, Shelby Power Racing, Anton Di Pasquale and Will Davison in 13th and 14th. They've got much better race cars than qualifying cars. Will Brown, big accident yesterday, good job. Jack LeBrock back towards the pointy end, good job. Andre Heimgartner, the fast Kiwi for Brad Jones Racing, lines up alongside David Reynolds. Remember, David had a curb hop at turn two, and that put him way back. Todd Hazelwood, another very fast South Australian, lines up in eighth alongside Jimmy Golding in seventh. Thomas Randall, who's been very fast all weekend, lines up alongside Brock Feeney. For the team's championship, it's going to be a battle at the front between Feeney and Kostecki. Chas Mostert and Cam Waters, third and fourth. Matt Payne, what a tremendous seconds. job by this rookie this year, making sen seven of the ten shootouts. Lines up alongside champion elect Brody Kostecki, who celebrates his 11th career pole and his 10th pole for the season. What a season it's been for him. First time winner on the streets of Melbourne at Albert Park earlier in the year and has continued to build from there. He grabs first gear, he's got his eyes on the starters roster and Paul Martin's going to start proceedings up there today. Green flag to get our formation lap underway. Paul's carrying the Dunlop a good year auto care helmet cam and the field gets underway and it is cool to say that there are 25 cars out there. I didn't think we would see that Cam Hill car when I saw how hard it whacked the wall at turn eight earlier in the day. For it to be out there is a real tribute to the men and women in that team. Typically, you'd be taking them back to a jig in the workshop and piecing that car back together. So that's a fantastic storyline and well done. Huge amount of work. If you're only just settling down to catch up with all the supercar action, we are in Adelaide. And the story so far has been a great one. We've had four days of activity here, jam-packed crowds and a lot going on. Cam Waters got the job done yesterday. Smiling <laughs> Tim Edwards. Well, he was smiling. 
And Cam got the 150 points, put together another victory off the back of his great run on the Gold Coast. But the real focus and storyline was around this fellow because Brody Kostecki, after working so hard throughout the championship year, became champion-elect with a great run to sixth position with enough points to be clear of Shane Van Gisbergen. And then how's this story? Comes back today in the top 10 shootout for Armourall and he takes the number one pole position. Gets the armor all bucks in the process and he starts in the ideal slot for this afternoon. And it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because he takes a free swing now. You're going to see a different Brody Kostecki. I was talking to him in the garage before I come up to the comm box to say, what have you done? He said, we've tuned it up, Scafie. So let's hope that car's more competitive. Matt Payne looking for his first win. What a rookie year. As we look at the Century Batteries tech facts, what we learnt yesterday, is that tyre wear rating, or the degradation as we often call it, it's absolutely zero. We're going to modify that. The medium that's on there now, we saw lots of different strategies, and it's going to play out differently. I would have lost the house in a bet yesterday. For sure. There were several people saying to me that that was going to be a talking point. I actually saw a blistered tyre, so I didn't think the tyres were going to make it to the end of the run. Not only did they not make it, they got faster at the back end of the stint. They had neg deg. Yep, exactly. Negative degradation. Yep. So that wasn't a factor at all. That was the reason why I didn't cover it off in the Hino Hub today. I sort of withdrew from that notion. <laughs> all right, jumping on board with all the various drivers that we're going to keep an eye on this afternoon. All of your favourites are out there. We saw some premium racing yesterday. We're going to see it again today, Larko. Oh, how good is it, Crompo? Look at the size of the crowd up here. Brody Kostecki is not going to want to win this race like he won the championship. He's going to want to do it from the front. Shane Van Gisbergen, he's way back in the pack, and we know how good he is in these circumstances. And as we said, there are about eight little subplots in here, including the team's championship. But... If you're a Ford fan like me, get your buddy to go and get the drinks because you don't want to leave your seat. Kostecki and Payne on the front row of the grid. Row number two is Waters and Mostert. Paul Martin is staring intently at the front of the field. This is going to be huge. Big roar from the crowd in the background. Brody's got nothing to lose. This is the final race of the season. It's time. yesterday in that zone, but they get through safely today. Beautiful start by Matt Payne. Too much wheel spin for Brody. He'll be kicking himself because he got a really good jump and then way too much wheel spin. Excellent start, Matt Payne. Cold tyres out there. And you can see Feeney working the car around the Red Bull car to try and get some temp and pressure up as quick as he can. Turn 8 is treacherous on a cold tyre. Look at Randall coming down the inside. So is Todd Hazelwood. It is over in the dirt. And in fact, there's been a little bit of light contact with Heimgartner down there. Huge amount of congestion as Shane Van Gisbergen tries to get traction out the other side. Turn 11, back to second gear. Uses the island on the inside, up and over the kerb. And Shane is down in 15th position behind Anton Di Pasquale. There's a margin that the first three have got over Cam Waters at the moment. At the end of our first lap, we have got Matt Payne, Brody Kostecki, Chas Most at one, two, and three. What a great opening lap. And very little movement in the field. No absolute standout and no absolute drop off. So nicely done by everybody at the pointy end, especially. And there's a good battle going on in the background there with Chaz Mostert in behind. In third, he was able to make one spot and he's parked himself in behind the two leaders. James Gordon, you've got a battle going here with Anton Di Pasquale. Uh, Shane Van Gisbergen is the Red Bull car that you can see just at the lead of that group. Now, Payne's opened up about a half-second margin now on this first flying lap. He's gone quicker in the first sector. Courtney hunting for some fresh air out to the right-hand side on the run down to turn eight, picking up Payne on the run to nine. Payne, Kostecki, 
then lost a decent start. Look at Brock. Feeney having a look down the inside. Forces the issue with Cam Waters, who has to open the steering. Makes him vulnerable to his teammate. And there was a bit of contact there with James Golding right in behind Randall. It's side-by-side -side action when they get down to 11. That tends to end in tears. Reynolds awkwardly placed, but has to drop back into line. Yeah, that was a bad spot for David Reynolds to be around the outside of that kink at turn 10 before you turn left. We've seen some really big crashes there over the years. James Courtney and Craig Lowndes had a monster there many years ago. And now we pick up on Heimgartner battling in there with James Golding and Hazelwood. So Heimgartner's come up there one spot. He's actually going two. have a look at the starts because this was very interesting the, the initial jump for Brody the reaction time was beautiful but then way too much wheel spin you actually see the back of the car start to fishtail a little Mostert was probably the best of the top three but then yep. there's nowhere to go and when you're on the outside down there it's easy to get fed into the gravel so he had to drop back into line that pain oh that was beautiful next to no wheel spin problem is he's on the wrong side of the road down here and manages to get out the other side and do it properly. So that's a real challenge because he's also wondering whether or not he can close down without getting turned around. If he closes too tight across the nose of Brody, he can turn himself. So that is the problem when you're on the outside of the road down there. And look at that, done nicely. And, and he was smart, he didn't turn right across, no, did he? No, no, he just left it. You get a free kick on the opening lap, so yep. use it wisely. Brody had to think about poking it up the inside of turn four. And wasn't able to do it. Feeney's gone faster in sector one than the rest of them. Reynolds is quick in sector two. Kostecki make that now paying the fastest in sector three. David Reynolds still down in 10th. He hasn't made any ground and he's battling hard with Todd Hazelwood who has a lot of locals. He's a South Australian boy with his last drive this weekend for the Blanchard Racing Team and his future at the moment is up in the air as to what he's going to do, whether he's going to be a co-driver or a full-time driver or drive in another category next year. Mate, have a, a bit of emotion there, but there's lots of stories like that. Scott Pye is also one of those. There's so many through the field. Neil's been talking about it all weekend, the level of change that we've got going into 2024. There's roughly a third of the field changing around and a lot of emotion and a lot of final drives that will be very important for every one of these people today. Reynolds gets an effective pass down, down the inside. Remember, he got penalised in the shootout for jumping up over the kerb, getting a kerb strike. Makes it hard work from that position as we look at exit turn 11. 0.7 of a second, three quarters of a second, the margin between Payne and Kostecki. Reynolds up to that ninth position in that move. Round the fastest in sector one, Van Gisbergen sector two, Brody Kostecki fastest in sector three, and our fastest lap of the race so far is a 21 flat for Brody. People are settling in now and finding their rhythm. Very even speed across the lead group of cars. This is a nice little battle pack though, isn't it? You've got Reynolds, Golding, Hazelwood, Brown lurking around here as well. And then just in behind him is Van Gisbergen. So this is building a lot of pressure in this group. Just in behind Shane, you've got Will Davison and Jack LeBrock behind them. And was that Shane up the inside? I think yep. he actually got that pass done. He did, but I don't think it's totally done. Oh, oh, oh. and they ran into each other. So the bloke is replacing Van Gisbergen at the Red Bull Apple Racing Team. They make contact in a straight line. And this is not over yet either because Shane's going to fire back to the inside as they come out of eight. And he is, he's down there. He forces his way down there, actually. Have a look at the number of spots now that Will Brown's going to lose. Look at the queue that's forming up behind this little battle here at the moment. So that was spectacular between Van Gisbergen and Brown. That all went sideways by accident yesterday between those two cars. Meantime, we've still got three quarters of a second pain over Kostecki. Down the inside comes her cat. Oh, awkward contact. That's bad. And sends him to the wall. That was LeBrock, I believe. Yes, Jack LeBrock is in the wall now. Is he going to be able to get this thing out? So that was a bit of a trip, clumsy manoeuvre. 
that resulted in ending up on the outside there. He's got reverse, thankfully, and gets it underway. So race control just holding off the button for the moment to get him back going. Oh, he's got right front steering damage. He's going to have to come back into the lane to attend to that. Fastest lap of the race is now Brock Feeney. Have a look at that front wheel angle. So he's well up the inside there, Nick Perkett. And then right there, that, that little clumsy tangle where wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact happened again. Now, that's what happened yesterday up at Turn 4 that had catastrophic effect. And similar sort of thing here today. But fortunately, it's a lower speed impact, but with the tyre barrier on the outside of the final turn at 14. And Nick was well past at that point. So it's just one of those awkward things. They will have a look at it, I'm sure. Meantime, Matt Payne's actually pushed harder again in the first sector here. He's now opened the margin up to just under one second. Matt Payne, Brody Kostecki and Chas Boston. He's just given himself a little bit of an extra breather on this last lap. Now, he's not yet had a podium in his career. Is that on for today? What a great job he's done in qualifying. And he's been threatening this. I mentioned earlier in the broadcast that if you look at his trend through the year, when he got to tail and bend, it all clicked into place for him. They made good ground with their setup. He started to come to terms with the task, and he now looks very settled in there as we pick up on Todd Hazelwood, sitting in 10th position at the moment. And they are investigating in race control the incident down there at the final corner that we just looked at from several angles. Now, these guys have got history from yesterday, remember? Hazelwood blocked the wheel and fired into James Golding at the final corner and ended up getting a penalty for that excursion. So they've been battling for two days in a row, these two. James Golding had a drama there before. Now, that, uh, what, that's uh, Cam Hill's car parked, is it? Or oh, is that what LeBrock still couldn't get back? Well, it might be LeBrock because he was lifting yeah, out that's of the right. way with the okay. steering damage. Yeah. So yeah. he's parked, which is very good, very respectful. He's parked out of the way. He's just trying to limp back into the pit area. So good presence of mind there by Jack LeBrock. And when you said about the pace of the last lap for Matt Payne, on that corresponding lap, David Reynolds has done the fastest lap of the race. Matt just did his fastest lap, 1 minute 20.9. Brody did a 21.1. Chaz did a 21.1. Feeney did a 21 flat. And Reynolds, as you picked up on, has just done the quickest one. So he's got a little bit of fresh air around him at the moment. So he's just squeezing a tiny little bit more margin out there at the moment. Just got a little bit in hand. And then only Matt will know whether or not he's taking much energy out of those tyres. Clearly for Kostecki and for Mostert at the moment, they're not, they're not buying into that game. Interesting one for me is that Cam Waters doesn't seem quite as strong in this opening stint of the race. Yesterday he had immense speed pretty much at any point of the race. In fact, in segment one and two of the race, he was probably the fastest car which won the race for him rather than the final stint. So, but when you look at him now, Thomas Randall's made ground on him and he's come back off Brock Feeney. So Feeney made a bold move down there at the hairpin, was able to get the Camaro down the inside. But it doesn't look like Cam's quite as fast today. No further action for what happened there with cars 2 and 34 on lap 6, turn 14 in that final corner. Confirmed there on the graphic. Mostert there sitting in third position at the moment, starting to feel a little bit of hot breath on the back of his neck from Brock Feeney up here in turn four. He's getting closer all the time. Got 70 laps to run in this one. We've only been racing for a little over 11 minutes and this is brewing up at the moment. We've got Thomas Randall in behind Cam Waters. These fellas are back in fifth and sixth at the moment. Your observation a moment ago was that Waters doesn't seem to have quite the firepower. They weren't going to make much in the way of change to that car, but maybe whatever they've done, it hasn't liked. Slightly different conditions today. It's the first time we've seen a number in the 20s for the entire weekend as Thomas Randall has a think about trying to sneak down the inside of his teammate, and now he presses on with it, and he's done it. Moves him up into position number five in the Castrol entry, looking down the left-hand sill panel into turn 11. Heimgarten and now right on the back of this little train here as well. And then Reynolds, who's made a little bit of ground up into eighth from 10th on the grid.
Payne's now got 1.3 seconds, so we're going to speed check on in this lap. 20.9 for Matt, 20.9 for Brody, 21.3 for Mostert, 21.1 for Feeney. So Chaz has just lost a little bit of the edge on that lap, probably by virtue of having to run slightly defensive now that Brock's all over the back of him. And you can see that he's lost touch with that lead group. So he's a little bit vulnerable here. It's the youngster, the second car in the queue here that did such a magnificent job on the Sunday last year. So he's searching, hunting high and low here. Turn seven. He almost offered it up into turn six then. Come out of five very well, and he almost offered it up. It, it is a move sometimes. It's a, it's a bold one and opportunistic. On board now through turn eight. Mostert did a nice job there to get through there with nice flow and just have enough gap. So the proximity of where Feeney was braking. Oh, I thought there was going to be a bump there in the braking area with David Reynolds and Andre Heimgartner. Just a little bit too far back that time for Brock Feeney. And if you're a car length or car length and a half away from Mostert in that zone, he breaks the car very well all the time, Chaz, and you're just not going to be able to get down there without making contact. But he has absolutely got car pace on him now, and they've improved Brock Feeney's car today. Looking at those numbers again, Matt Payne just on his fastest lap of the race with a 20.8. Brody Kostecki, 20.9. Thomas Randall, 21 dead, and the fastest lap of the race now has actually gone to Van Gisbergen with a 20.73. Brock's on the toe ball here, isn't he? He's yep. right on the bumper of this thing. So he might have it all, oh, and, and he yep. slid it out there the other side. Here comes is. the dive at uh, turn six, done nicely. And beautiful work there by, by Brock. So all triggered by too much wheel spin. And, hit him. and now wheel spin subsequently in a slide. Was that a little touch? Yep. You're and if it was, does he need to regress? Right. Yep. And now, and look at Randall trying to find a way as these two sort it out. So Mostert back here in front. And is there a little bit more to unpack in all that? I didn't fully see it as they were negotiating turn seven. I reckon that Chaz probably should have given the throttle a little breather and let Brock back by because Brock's move at turn six was completely fine. But I'm sure there was a little bump on the way into seven, which put Brock right out sideways and almost in the fence. So watch this again. Let's investigate. Here's the move up the inside cleanly. Now here's the response back down to the right hander down at turn seven. There was a touch. He yep. did touch him. So, and he's got the big slide going on. And that's where you called for the idea of the redress to just try and rectify that so that the umpire doesn't have to make the decision for you. So I'd look down only to look back up again to see Brock sliding. Missed the little contact. Here's the bumper cam version. This is out of five. Dives down the inside at six. And now here's the corresponding view. Listening. Got him. And a little touch up. And now the problem they had was if they came out of the throttle at that point, they both would have got swamped by Randall as well. Uh, that is under investigation. No surprise, as you can see on the graphic. So, Feeney and Mostert. Yeah, no, if I'm in the WAU bunker at the moment, I'm saying, Chaz, just find a nice, convenient way of letting Brock go back by, because it doesn't affect Randall, doesn't affect anybody at that point, but it does affect the run that Feeney had at that time, because he actually had the pressure on Mostert and put a fair pass on him. So, um, I think... If they don't do it themselves, someone else will do it for them. <laughs> yes. Century Batteries Chopper gives us a great view over the final corner. And a glimpse of the precinct. That's the word from Martin Short to Brock that it's under investigation, because no doubt Brock raised the question, what's that all about? So they're having a think about that up in Motorsport Australia race control at the moment. They've got data, they've got images, they've got replay machines to be able to look at how all that unpacks and unfolds. Cam Waters with a special livery on this weekend. Tribute to Ken Block right there. Last weekend for Tim Edwards in that outfit, as we've detailed frequently. In behind him is Heimgartner, he's seventh. Then it's Reynolds, then Golding, then Hazelwood in the 10. Just outside we've got... Van Gisberg. There's control to all teams. Five second time penalty to car 25 for a driving infringement. James Taylor, race director. The umpire's given the call. 
So they're expecting to add five seconds now in the stock for car number 25. Now, where he sits in the group at the moment, if you added five seconds to he puts him down around 11th or 12th. So that's very costly. And it's been a tricky day for Declan Fraser in the Trady Beer entry. They had to change a radiator earlier on, and now he's in the garage with a power steering failure. The boys have got a new pump ready to go. But, yeah, tough day to top off a really difficult season for the rookie here in Declan Fraser. Chevy Camaro, Jack LeBrock is back out in the race. The crew replaced a right front steering arm from that contact with Nick Perkett. And the only damage from the tyre bundles on the left side was a bit of race tape holding the bonnet down. He's back in the race. That's good news. Thanks for the update there, Ree. And Jack, just an awkward one, wasn't it, where he's bumped off the road at such low speed, but it's still enough to end up copying a bit of damage in that wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact that happened there. So a five-second penalty now hanging over Mostert. He'll serve that in these first of two compulsory stops. Margin now one and three quarter seconds. Payne over Kostecki. And they're encouraging Matt Payne at the moment to just have a think about his brake bias. Encouraging him that he's doing a great job. Stay focused. Don't forget to download the new Supercars app. It's available in the Apple App Store or Google Play. Lots of new trick features. Lots of things to keep you engaged as a race fan on some of these awesome races that we've got coming up in 2024, including a visit once again back to New Zealand, which we can't wait to jump across the Tasman one more time. Oh, that was awkward, Heimgartner. And here we go. David Reynolds now has got plenty of incentive to giddy up and try and attack him on the outside. Now he crosses down the inside. Andre covers. David's forced wide. He'll crisscross the bumper and try and get up the inside with better traction. Made a bit of wheel spin as he tried to do it couldn't quite get the power to the road. That was awkward for Andre. It's a thunderous roar of those cars as they make their way down the pit straight because of the proximity of the pit building and the new roof on the grandstand opposite. It's a giant supercar speaker. <laughs> Very noisy down there, but it's a sweet sound. Having a look up on the outside, Reynolds. He's looking to try and crisscross and have a think about getting up the inside and he's going to poke it. Yep. Done. Nice work. So we've seen that successfully applied several times this weekend now. It's opening up as another passing opportunity. So well done. David Reynolds moves it up into position number seven now. Two seconds to gap. Payne over Kostecki. Mostert in third with the five-second penalty and he's got pressure at the moment from Feeney. And Brock's moved back up closer to his rear bumper. Hazelwood now on Golding. And he gets cleanly by at turn nine. Van Gisberg and also trying to get a run then. So when you look at the movers and shakers, David Reynolds is up three, Van Gisberg and up four. And this is the Bunnings trade power pass. And it was a nicely executed manoeuvre. He just fainted to the left, flicked hard down to the right. That little bit of a slide that Heimgartner had there that was really telling because the little slide just gave the level of momentum. Watch this. So as they come off six, that little slide just there was just enough for David to get down the inside. Now Shane Van Gisbergen's in the pit because they're going to do this strategy and go for a long middle stint for this race. This is a clever move. A green rears, green rears. It's going to have great drive traction with those fresh rear tyres on it. And when he comes back out, the only car in front of him in the next couple of hundred metres is Jack LeBrock, who's been yeah, into the pit for those repairs. So Shane's, uh, Shane's got some fairly clear track to deal with now. As Perkett comes out the other side. And already, Perkett's got a bad sportsmanship flag for exceeding track limits. It's, Early days, wow, to not have much more credit in the bank to be able to deal with that. This is around the back of the paddock area, turn 13. You can see the pit building and the corporate hospitality area. The garages and all the transporters lined up there into that tight corner. That's a very clear illustration of just how tight and slow that final corner is. There's a lot of good runoff area down there. But just on the exit was where LeBrock ended up being escorted out to the wide across the grass and onto the tyres there as Golding, Davison, Brown and Jones all come in. And he copped a bit of damage in the process because the fence line comes back there. Well done. Here we go. 
Oh, that, so there was a pretty big difference there in terms of fuel loading between them. What, what's that doing pointing in that direction? It's, it's yeah, I, I, I have no idea. Oh, he's got hit. Oh, he's going to go, okay, he's got T-bone. Right, now I understand it. That's not a little bit of contact, that's, no. That's, uh, that's dangerous, isn't it? Wow. So I, I, I looked up and went, I actually yeah. had to work out the orientation, uh, orientation of the car. Orientation after <laughs> So that was very odd. This is Macaulay Jones, and it, it's taken a fair thud. I wonder whether or not there's, there's any residual damage as a result of that. Well, you'd have to think so. It was ended up at, I mean, I know they're only doing 40 Ks, but it ended up up on two wheels almost. So what's this? When it hits... That got hit quite hard, didn't it? Big time. So that was James Golding, and that'll uh, no doubt be an unsafe release. So a little mix up there and down the inside, and this is a nice move by Brock Feeney. And he's been attempting that now for the last several laps. He lost a bit of ground in that stuff that went on at turn seven, and now he's able to clear him. Thomas Randall is right in here as well, just on the back of this group. And under investigation, car 31 for unsafe release. Well done. Yeah. So, they will have just made the call and not realised that Macca was in the queue there. And even, it's amazing though, isn't it, that even though it's very slow, how easily it flipped the car. The, the worry there is all the air bottles and there are people standing in the pit lane. Randall does look like his car's a little better today. He's been able to move away from Cam Waters in 5th and 6th, so they've swapped over yesterday. They've swapped the order today for Tickford. Matt Payne's stretched this lead out now to almost three seconds over Brody Kostecki, so it's been a beautiful opening stint. He hasn't missed a beat. Haven't seen any errors, and he just keeps on squeaking the margin away. That car's fast, and he does have a tiny little bit of a lap speed advantage. Brody Kostecki there in second. Here's the gap back to third. Now, that's freshly changed with Brock Feeney having now got by Chas Mostert after they had a little tangle between turns six and seven a few laps ago. Thomas Randall's lurking now on the back of Chas Mostert. to all teams. Pit lane drive-through penalty to car 31 for an unsafe release. That's James Golding. And no surprise there, the new on racing car was released from the pit lane into the side of the number 96 Pizza Hut entry of Macaulay Jones. Half spinning Macaulay's car around in the lane. And lucky nobody else got caught in the middle of all that. Certainly from a personnel standpoint. Now Randall got a good run through there and he's going to have a think about this. He runs the diagonal, just releases the brake pedal late to try and put that extra little bit of pressure on Mostert. Chaz had just enough margin in hand to be able to keep the position through the right-hander. I got to the bottom, um, we'll see a shot of him no doubt at some point in the afternoon. I got to the bottom of the Deep Pasquale problem yesterday as yeah. well. Remember that car was involved in the contact with Will Brown and then it was actually motoring along okay. Made it. it started to unwind the steering right, arm. Oh, there, mate, right that's what it was. Yeah. And that's why it started crabbing as Thomas Randall comes in. Right, yeah, so yeah, so loosen the lock nut, decide to give itself a wheel alignment. Wow. And they were talking about safety. Uh, clear. I wouldn't like to be doing that stint like that. Go, 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 go. That was a quick stop. Nice and efficient. Good job there. Thomas Randall in out. The trend for these 250k races has been to not take too much fuel in the first stop. On average, the leading group yesterday sort of stopped around that lap 30 mark-ish, slightly under, slightly over, and took a, around about... Uh, 25 to 30 litres, depending. This is tight, this is tight. And they're going to go all the way up the inside. And Van Gisberg, it's going to force the issue and forces it hard. Oh, no space on the outside there. Randall comes back at turn five. Good hard racing through there. All drivers giving respect and space. And this doesn't work for Van Gisberg if he gets held here because the short fill strategy, they only put 12 and a half litres in that car. If he hasn't got clear track, it does not work. Oh. I don't think there was a huge amount of fuel went into Tom's car either. So I think it was only 20-odd litres went into his car. So 
So this is wild. Look at Shane's car moving around at turn eight. And he now dives down the inside. Thomas tries to cover, but there's not much he can do about it. SVG gets down the inside, and so does Will, but he's now side by side through the left hander at 10. Has to drop it back. That's awkward. Thomas continues the battle through turn 11. Those cars on the tow rope through there, locked together. Feeney and Pi now in. Go, go, go. So this is interesting because the teammates are going to be line astern with Feeney coming out. And here comes Van Gisbergen. And the Van Gisbergen strategy was totally around a short fill and a long middle stint. But clear track was fundamental to that strategy. When he came out and he saw Randall, and Randall's not over here because he's at great pace. So he's going to turn in with him. Oh, they go in, and that will be steering arm damage, I'm pretty sure. I've got steering damage. He just opened the wheel on me. There you go. Yeah, but they don't like that side-to-side -side okay, contact. Check confirmed. Check steering and confirm, please. Waiting for a response there from Thomas Randall. Chris Duckey's his engineer on screen. Here's the replay. So remember, he'd only just stopped. So fresh tyres, has a dive up the outside and then turns in. They make wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact. And the question mark now hanging over the 55 Castrol car. So tries to go around the outside. Very difficult to do up there at turn four. In the process of the contact, Will Davison gets an easy pass done. Here it is again, chopper view. Yeah, he opened the wheel on him. So what he said over the radio was that Shane actually didn't end up making the apex. He opened the wheel on him and effectively escorted Thomas wide. And that's why Thomas was so vocal over the radio immediately. So he, he said to Chris Stuckey, just open the wheel on me and then when you make that sort of contact, the steering damage that has been incurred will be a serious problem for Thomas Randall now. It's under investigation too up at turn four. 97.55, lap 21. Confirmed with the graphic on screen. Well, it's been an interesting start to proceedings out there. We've still got 57 laps to run. 4.4 seconds though, Matt Payne continues to build his lead. This has been a great stint for him. It has been a great stint. Not a mistake. Ah, oh, beautiful slide. Does he keep it on the island? No. Does he get away with it? Yes. But that was completely sideways. And here's our champion elect. Now just uh, nicely done, in and out quickly. Maybe looking to get some undercut benefit here. Remember, there was a four plus second margin in favor of Matt Payne as they came in for this first stop. What fuel did he put on, Neil? Uh, 23 litres on our numbers. So that's about the same as they were doing yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah, they were a little bit more yesterday for the lead trio, uh, of which Thomas Randall took the least amount in his first stop. So let's have another look at how this has transpired. So they've come through turn three, a little bit of a run there, Randall. And Randall goes up the outside, which is always a risky manoeuvre. Now watch where they get to, and Shane does not make the apex, and the contact is made on the turn into turn four. Andrew Edwards is the engineer for Shane Van Gisbergen. That's Martin Short, who's engineering. Brock Feeney, Prince of Jamie Winkup, seven-time champion in the background there as well. And remembering that with Shane in the middle of the road, He's also not on the optimal line there, and he's trying to get as far into the corner as he can to defend under the brake. So he's trying to plunge in there as far and deep as he can. Reynolds is now in. And here we go for Randall on Brown. Nice. So Reynolds, Hazelwood are now in. No further action for what happened up there at turn four, Garth. And we'll come back to Garth while he gets sorted down there. So Reynolds in and out nicely. That's Todd Hazelwood in the background, the red arc entry. Interestingly, they, they didn't react straight away with Matt Payne. So they've, uh, they've left him out there for the time being. 
And that's because the lap pace is still pretty strong on that car at the moment. So his first sector on the last lap was a 7.5. His mid-sector was a 20.3. If you cast your mind back to qualifying earlier today, we were getting excited when you saw high 19s in the mid-sector. So he's only dropped about three to four tenths of a second based on peak numbers that we saw in the shootout earlier on. Lost it on screen. And we get a lap speed read shortly. Just to, I just want to understand what the pace is on uh, Matt's car as he now enters the pit lane. So they are reacting. They did an extra lap there. Now the curiosity will be just how much fuel they put in. And do they decide to fuel relative to the opposition to hold track position or run their own race? Fresh screen tyres on the rear. So a time stop, strategically done. Thomas Randall very fast now in sector one. Fastest lap of the race belongs to Will Brown. One minute, 20.5. In and out, the original race leader. And he comes out just in front of the truck assist entry. And I want to see how much fuel they took with that car. Now they took 29 and a half litres. We'll call it 30 for rounding. So they've got a little bit more fuel into that car, and they can do that because they've got a bit of a cushion when they came in the room, but they had just about four and a half second margin yeah, yeah. when he peeled off. So he's taken about an extra six litres, roughly, extra couple of seconds of fuel compared to Brody. All right, so we have got six cars out there that are yet to take their compulsory stop number one of two. Chas Bostop, Waters, Heimgarten, Adi Pasquale, Winterbottom and Fullwood. Top six cars. Chas Mostert and Cam Waters have had one or two hefty battles over the years and they're back out there duking it out again. Here's the onboard from Cam. Turn one. Let's see what the strengths and weaknesses of this car look like relative to his mate. Flashed the lights at him. Yep. Up at the western end of the racetrack, and then he's done a nice job of sliding down the inside. I'm glad we jumped on right at that moment because we got to see the setup and then we got to see the execute. And Chaz didn't really. And he's coming in this lap, Chaz. Try to cover because of this. So he, he knew that he was coming in and he knew that Cam had a run on him. So there was no use trying to balk him or move across. It was only going to cost both drivers time. So he, he basically put the white flag up and moved it wide. And he's got a little unscheduled holiday here. He's yeah. got a five second pause in the process. Green tyres, so shiny green tyres going on the rear. And I'm just looking at my screen, it hasn't come up properly yet, but Brody. So they put a fair bit of fuel on. Now they're doing the five seconds. And away he goes. OK, buddy, so you've got green rears right in front, green rears right in front. You've got Frosty on exit, Frosty on exit, all position. So he's going to have a fairly decent amount of uh, low speed traction and grip. So he's got scrub fronts, fresh rear tyres on that car, and uh, car number 25 there. Apart from the five seconds standstill for the penalty, on our numbers they took a little over 50 litres. So that's probably the greatest fuel load that we've seen. And the reason they've done that was that we're going to have to sit here. We may as well try something different as a recovery tactic based on the fact that we've got a penalty for what happened up at Turn 7 earlier on with Brock Feeney. And Frosty's all over him. He's got warm tyres on that car as Heimgarten comes out of second place into the pit lane. And so does Deep Pasquale that we spoke about before with the weird steering problem yesterday. Here's Andre. We 
wheels are done, just waiting on fuel. 10 seconds. This is the car that I spoke about yesterday that was in that contact with Will Brown up at four. We didn't think it had taken too much of a bruise. As Declan Fraser goes back into the garage, sadly, in the trading entry. And uh, it had a mind of its own when it came to the steering arm in car number 11, the Shelby Power Racing Team entry, which was a real shame. Ben Croak said this morning it was probably a top four or five car, so that result went wanting. And uh, now Frosty's going to be all over the back of Anton here, so Dick Pasquale is going to have to work hard to try and cover him on the run up to turn four. He'll need to drive it in the gutter, but Frosty's even further to the right. He's almost on the footpath he was. to be able to get down the inside. So he got that done very nicely then. He had a hustle on. Now, here we go. Brock Feeney has managed to slice straight down the middle. Red Bull meeting the sandwich and then a crisscross for Brody out the other side. How cool is this? So this is on the replay. This is all going on while we were focused on the pit stops. And uh, they were only a wafer thin margin apart on the run into turn number one. So oh. how's, how's that? Smith going to the pit lane. This is on board with Brody. Here goes the Red Bull car down the inside, looking for the crisscross. And the problem with being out here that I explained early off the start of the race is the challenge of having to then close down onto the racing line into one. And there was just a little moment where the side draft of the two cars drew them together. Another replay here of Waters getting down the inside of Mostert. Fullwood's in now as well in the Midi's electrical entry. And very good pace. Todd Hazelwood's actually done the fastest lap of the race. But David Reynolds on the last lap has done his fastest lap also about six hundredths of a second away from what the fastest lap is, but personal best for Reynolds. So he's showing pace. So is Matt Payne now with the fastest first sector. Who's the first in the queue that's taken his compulsory stop and he's got a two and a half second margin over Brock Feeney. Now Payne took, I'm just gonna round it for simplicity, 30 litres of fuel. So he's got about 10 more on than Brock. That's the reason why that margin's just a little bit tighter. And Waters has yet to take that stop. There's also a little anomaly there between Kostecki and Feeney, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. Waters said to me earlier today that if it weren't for the way that the fuel window worked for them, his tyres were well capable of actually going on in the stint. He was mighty impressed with the consistency. And as I said earlier, right at the very beginning, he had negative degradation. There was nowhere at all with those tyres. It's rare that they get better when they get older. <laughs> but Certainly. it's to do with the track condition and the temperature, the amount of rubber on the road. But the Dunlop soft tyre was working really well out there. Here he is. So he's our race leader, yet to stop. He's got 19 seconds at the moment on Matt Payne. Matt in turn's got 2.8 seconds over Brock Feeney. And there's a slight difference in the fueling between those at the moment. And it's in favour of Matt. Meantime, Anton's going very quick out there after that stop that we witnessed a few moments ago. He's just done the fastest lap of the race, a 20.2. And it really underscores the importance of track position because he's down in 15th, had a tricky qualifying, quick car, but it's hard to recover from down there. Yeah. Now, Payne is pushing hard on this next tyre set here as well. He's just gone faster in the first sector. He's got purple on his name. I think Cam Walsh is coming in here now. That's a pretty solid stint. And that mirrors pretty much what he did yesterday. So he stopped on lap 30. Right mirror down, couple of clicks. There you go. Yeah, so yeah we'll do our best, mate. We'll uh, only a short stop here, so we'll concentrate on fuel and tyres. We'll do our best. Yeah, that's maybe. That's a, That answer's a maybe. We'll try and make a change for you. That's basically a slow no. Yeah. <laughs> Now, when he stopped yesterday on lap 30, he took 27 litres of fuel. So it's a pretty lively battle. Go, 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 go. There was no time at all to do anything under the back of that car in that stop. Yeah. But that's the battle on the left-hand side of the screen from the Century Batteries chopper. And here's the rejoin. Spearing down the inside is Brown. He could see Cam Waters coming out, so he released the brake and actually turned in to turn one faster than he would like, but he got away with it because he was able to spear it across the kerb and remain in control of the Coke Camaro. And he did that purposely just to try to avoid being caught by waters. And now Cam having a little show of the nose at turn seven. We've seen a lot of overtaking in that little zone there at six and seven today.
it, it must be a changed characteristic in the cars. We didn't see as much of that previously, but they obviously like being able to sneak up the inside there, particularly if you compromise coming out of turn six and you've got a bit of wheel spin. Waters thought long and hard about it, couldn't quite get it done. Meantime, it's a 3.8 second margin pain over Feeney at the moment. He's starting to just stretch that lead with the pace that he's showing. We haven't seen him even blink so far. He hasn't looked like putting a foot wrong. But it's a very good battle. What we're looking at from the chopper a minute ago has Waters slides down the inside there. Nicely executed. Beautiful manoeuvre. But Feeney, Kostecki and Reynolds are line of stern in second, third and fourth. And that's them. So that brawl that you're watching then, everybody clustered around positions 8, 9, 10, 11. actually matching Matt Payne in the first sector on this lap. Brodick Stick is actually a little bit faster than both of them. But it's a decent cushion that Matt's got at the moment, both margin on the racetrack and a little bit of margin with fuel as well. There is another compulsory stop to come where they've got to deliver the balance of the 100 litre fuel stop and drop requirement. 47 laps remain. Pressure battle this one at the moment. So Matt's just up the road from all this, and this is the fun for second. Phoenix Kostecki Reynolds. Now, this could swing in any direction here. Hard when you're the meat in the sandwich because for Kostecki, he's, he's got to keep a balanced eye on what's going on in both departments, what's happening up front and behind. A bit of gravel got heaved onto the racetrack early in today's race as well, which I've noticed. That was that excursion that Cam Hill had, remember? Yeah. We watched that one. Kaseki, you can tell straight away, we know both of these teams in the team's championship between Red Bull Ampole Racing and the Coca-Cola Erebus team are battling. There was 161 point disparity between them before the start of the race. You see James Courtney there attacking the back of Will Brown. Todd Hazelwood just in behind there on the left hand part of your screen. And you can see Kostecki's much more aggressive, just the body language of the car. And Feeney, who was able to put that manoeuvre on Brody earlier after that little drama there with Jack Smith at turn 14, it now looks the other way. It now looks like Brody might have a little pace advantage over Brock who had the rear of the car just skipping under brakes into turn nine that time, was just hopping a little bit in the rear. So he was right at the very threshold of the braking performance of the car, and he gets another little love bite on the run into the final corner. So Brody just gives him a bit of a hurry up there. 3.8 seconds gap pain over Phoenix. No margin between second and third to Kostecki. And if anything, David Reynolds has got an ideal spot here at the moment. He can just watch all of this, see whether either of the two make it a simple mistake and he can get instant profit. The glimpse that you got was Matt Payne disappearing. That's 4.1 seconds now. And there he goes again, just on the exit of turn five. And it always feels around here when you are battling for second and you've got the leader in your sights. When they get away from you on that staircase section, you lose contact with them. So you always want to be able to see them between five and six and six and seven. Forty-five laps remain. We've been racing for a little over forty-five minutes. Now Kostecki has another peep down the inside. He gets it closed off. And in fact, he's run wide, Brody. That could make him quite vulnerable to David Reynolds here. We're watching the battle for second, third, fourth, and it's extremely tight. Meantime, Matt Payne continues to get a breather while all this goes on. This is providing him with a little bit of a free kick at the moment. Now, all of that, that move down into the hairpin cost Brody pretty significantly in the battle. It's going to take a little bit of time to be able to wind that margin back in on Brock. If anything, now he needs his elbows up high based on what Reynolds is capable of doing. And it looks a little bit under, under steery. So when he tried to get into turn nine, and Reynolds has got to run. He's dead set got to run here. And he's five down there. And he's made it stick. Nicely done, David Reynolds. Alistair Fain on the radio said, you'll get this done at four, and he did. 
So good pace there. So Brody's thing mustn't be quite to his liking at the moment. It doesn't take much to get out of rhythm. See whether or not things settle down or whether he can get back in tune with where Brock is, who's now got a couple of seconds on him down the road. Four and a half seconds is the gap now. Payne over Feeney. Plus his lap still belongs to Di Pasquale down in 15. And what Alistair will be saying to David Reynolds now is don't mess around with Brock Feeney because remember it was only a lap ago that Brody was having a dive at Feeney at, the, at that spot right there. So he was actually showing better pace. This is the move I just spoke of. So he actually moved it out under brakes. The problem is it locked the wheel right at the end. Here at lock, and then when it locked the right front, then he couldn't steer it. He understeered why. That was when David Reynolds got into position to put a move on him. So instead of being able to take the spot, he actually lost ground and then David was able to capitalise on a bad run out of turn three and straight down the inside with a bit of coaching by Alistair McVane, his engineer, said, you'll get this done. And we're on board now for it. Bang, straight down the inside. Hard to do. Very, very well done in terms of the execution there, David Reynolds. Brady didn't put up too much resistance either. That is Alastair watching from the Penrite Racing Garage. They're no longer a couple after the end of today's 78 lap. They've worked together for a really <laughs> long a period. <laughs> They've been together for a long period of time. Al's been whispering in his racing ear for quite some time. It's not, you don't have to ring the family law court or anything, do you? Or what do you do? <laughs> No longer a couple. <laughs> One of the many changes that we're going to deal with going into the new season in 24, which will get started at Mount Panorama Bathurst with the giant festival of speed next year for the Bathurst 12 hour and for event one of the Ripco Supercars Championship. Doesn't get old looking at the angles of the cars arriving and departing down there at turn eight. Todd Hazelwood sitting in 11th here in the Red Arc entry at the moment. He's got Scott Pye behind him. So two South Australian operators here doing a nice job, just hovering around the back end of the top 10. And I think Waters just made a move on Randall. I'll get that confirmed and moved up a spot. 4.7 seconds. P Payne's got pace here at the moment. He just keeps on squeaking a little bit further down the road with every passing lap. It's only millimetres, but it's enough to count. And he's got a bit of fuel in hand. Was on board with Scott Pyatt, Toyota Forklift Century, Team 18. He's on the move at the end of today. We'll see him come back next year in the Enduros Sandown and at Bathurst for the Red Bull Ampole Racing Team. Here is Waters. Yeah, you're right. He's been able to put a move on Randall. Waters is in behind Will Davison. And this is the move. Gee, I'll tell you what, as soon as you said that, People have gone and found it for you. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, nice job. He's done that pretty easily, hasn't he? So he's been able to sneak down the inside. This is the driver's eye view. Thomas doesn't put up too much of a battle here. Cam rocks on in there. So he's now behind Will Davison. Will's been having a bit of a challenge just finding happiness under brakes in this car. And... Uh, just ends up with too much rear locking right at the wrong time. But it looks like he's got some decent pace out there at the moment. He's up seven spots, so he's done a good job. So if you have a look at that totem, Reynolds, very good seven spots. Van Gisbergen outstanding. Will Davison, seven spots also. James Courtney up eight. Scott Pye up seven. Now, Cam's Whoa, actually going to have a go here. Yeah, you just spoke about it. It happened right there in front of Cam Waters in the braking area at Wakefield Street and locked the rears for about half the braking area. And they had challenges with that at Bathurst. Remember, they were changing brake sets and they had brake experts looking at master cylinders and been discussion about pads and all sorts of things. But, uh, yeah, pretty easy to see there. And it was a nice, easy manoeuvre down the inside for Cam Waters. So all of a sudden, he's invigorated, got himself up into sixth place. So next for him could be Shane Van Gisbergen. That's Shay in the foreground. So there's the wriggling at the back of the number 17 Shell V Power Racing Mustang and Waters just glides down the inside without too much stress on that one. 4.6 seconds static margin at the moment between Payne and Feeney. David Reynolds sitting in third. Brody in fourth, followed by Van Gisbergen. Gee, the young New Zealander today is putting on a clinic, isn't he? He's doing a really good job. 
almost five seconds up the road from Feeney and Reynolds and Kostecki. And David Reynolds at the same time has shown real pace to come from 10th. So it might end up as we get to this important half race milestone that we start to contemplate a Penrite racing double car podium with the way that Reynolds has made ground and the way that Matt Payne's been Mark driving. Payne, car behind is dropped to the 20.9, 20.9 last lap. Good communication, and that's the right sort of thing to say to him in that straight line gap between turn seven and turn eight, and then through the corner he goes, and then he responds, copy, so he understands what sort of number that he's doing. And with an almost five second margin, you don't need to stretch too much now because he's got that little gap in the fuel that Neil's been recalling, and the way that that is going to benefit Matt Payne is also going to be another extension of that time. Matt Payne made his supercar debut at Bathurst last year. As we pick up on Chaz Mostert here through turns 10 and 11. Chaz is sitting between Heimgartner and Di Pasquale in 14th at the moment. 4.48 seconds is the gap between Payne and Feeney. And Will Brown here is sitting in ninth position. He's got a bit of pressure on him from James Courtney. Then it's Hazelwood in the red, red arc entry. And we're just entering that phase of the day where if you just look off to the fringes of the racetrack, you start to see a fair amount of the Dunlop soft tyre rubber build-up. So you won't need to step offline too far here and you can find yourself in the wall and in the wars pretty quickly. It was really evident yesterday down at turn eight as the day wore on see a bit of it here also on the exit at turn seven. No great big deal there, but you've got to really adjust your racing line down here at turn eight, which the driver spoke to me about this morning. Look at this. So anything offline there, you misjudge that, and that would be just like an ice skating rink straight into the concrete. Uh, concrete. And then you can see there that braking area. It's a very busy street in as a public street circuit. It's a very busy area of Adelaide and that bumpy braking area at turn nine is very difficult to negotiate different surfaces and many bumps upset the car in that zone. And we've got 38 laps remaining. Having a look at Cam Waters who's showing great turn of speed here. He's going to do exactly the same manoeuvre on Van Gisbergen that he put on Thomas Randall and that he also uh, put on Will Davison. So Shane's got no fight in him down there. You can see him arriving on the scene. So he's quick at the moment. And here we are back with our race leader. He's got that now out to call it five seconds for rounding. It's 4.96 seconds. This is an amazing story. He's only just recently turned 21 years of age, just prior to Bathurst. Karting champion like many of the younger drivers. He's the winner of the Toyota Racing Series, the Open Wheel Series in New Zealand. Third last year in Dunlop Super 2 in his quest to become a uh, full-time supercar driver. Stephen Grove put a lot of faith in him. And, uh, gee, he's really delivered, hasn't he? Since the mid part of this year, his consistency, his concentration and his speed, most importantly, has really, really come alive. He got off to a tricky start. He threw up in his helmet prior to the start of race two at Newcastle earlier in the year. Yeah, <laughs> that wasn't nice. But this is that margin that he's got against the quality of the people that are running out there at the moment is spectacular. Have a look at this amount of fresh air. Yeah, absolutely. Has not put a foot wrong, has he? Made a beautiful start. He was able to coax his way around the outside of the second in the first corner and has not been headed since. Now that pass that you commented on with Cam Waters heading down the inside of Van Gisbergen for fifth position has actually been quite a big moment in the team's championship for the year because we keep on talking about the battle between Coca-Cola Racing by Erebus and the Red Bull Ampol Racing Team. That pass got Tickford into third in the championship. So the combined points for car five and six the pass obviously there today is not car six, it's car 43. 
But that pass for Cam Waters down the inside was enough then to jump Brad, Ro Brad Jones racing as cars 8 and 14. So that is then the garaging for the commencement of the 2024 championship. And then we know that we've got a live pit lane concept through the championship next year. Lucker? And Scavey, hasn't this Penrite racing team got some momentum at the moment? So let's have a chat to the captain of the ship that's uh, invested a lot here. Mate, we're fascinated to just watch the form of young Matt Payne at the moment. Steve, what did you see in him? Why did you grab this kid? Because he looks like another Kiwi that's going to do the business. Yeah, well, look, we watched him in Carrera Cup and we saw how good his data was. And even here, like at the moment, he's just a robot. Every lap's the same. His lap times are just really, really, really good. I have a theory, mate, because, you know, we've had McLaughlin and Coulthard and Stanaway's coming. You know, Wigram, Manfield, Taupo, where we're going, Pukakoe, all these gnarly Kiwi circuits. And if you prevail on those, I reckon you can prevail anywhere in the world. There's a little bit of that in there. Yeah, definitely. And we saw, him, you know, in the wet, um, he was really good in the first practice. So he, he's got the wet, the Kiwis have got the wet, and he's got the consistency. He's pretty unassuming. He just gets on with the job. So hopefully this, uh, this could be the, hopefully his day. Well, I'm going to pull his boots off because you pulled Shane Van Guzbergen's boots off. He's got webs between his toes. All right, mate. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Stephen Grove with Mark Larkham. Just as we're watching Cam Waters get down the inside of Brody Kostecki. That brings him now up into fourth position. That car's showing great speed. More speed. You commented in the first segment of the race that it didn't look great. And if you recall, he wanted a change, which he didn't get. So it's this tyre set, potentially, that's lit this car up. Yep. So he didn't get anything in the way of an adjustment to smarten up the balance of the car. But this car's come alive on this tyre set, for sure. Here's the replay again through turn eight, and then offers it up down the inside. He's able to do that with relative ease. Diagonals down to the apex down there. Brody sees him coming. They just haven't quite had the car today, have they, with Brody? It was good for Quali. Doesn't quite have the edge that it needs at the moment to offer some resistance down here. And Cam was able to get through the hairpin down there in second gear. Didn't even need to grab first slot to get it around there. Often you'll see when someone makes that move, they'll go all the way back to first just to be able to punch out the other side. You don't want to do that too many times. So that's the only little glimmer that we've seen where a small error like that can actually, in the end, have quite a big penalty. Just see how it can dislodge the left-hand side of that front air dam. Nearly ripped uh, Ned's beard off then. <laughs> it almost did. <laughs> so that pass that we saw Cam Waters put on Brody Kostecki was another part of the team's championship and the uplift of points for Tickford. And that's also why James Courtney's very energised to get by Will Brown for ninth position. So anything that they can do cements them into third spot in the garaging. So the way that it will line up for the start of 2024 in terms of the team's championship now would be the Coca-Cola Camaros followed by the Ripple Ampol Camaros and then the Tickford Mustangs for the start of next year. James is hustling on the back of Will Brown then. In the final corner. You heard Stephen Grove talk about Matt Payne and Carrera Cup in 21. He was sixth in that championship in that journey that's brought him here. We talked about carts and then Toyota Racing Series, Porsche Carrera Cup, and then the Dunlop Super 2 Series and now here. Yeah, so J uh, James also looks like he's got a reasonable bit of speed in this segment of the race and he's drawing Todd Hazel along with him in the process. So neither of, of the Coke cars have got awesome peak speed today. There's a little queue forming in behind Will Brown at the moment, so there's going to be a bit of pressure on him. Three cars in behind him. Now, when they stopped yesterday as a lead group, it was Randall that of the top three pitted earliest on lap 48. And Waters pitted on 52 and Reynolds on 54. So we're starting to zone into that area now within the next eight to ten laps. Ben Gisberg and, and Davis and Ian, as soon as you, you said that, that's the policy for them now. Chain stop is going to be very long, and so is Wills, because remember, at the start, there was only 12 and a half litres for Van Gisbergen, and not much 
Scott Moore was only 13.2 on our numbers for Will. Two, two very long stops. About 30 more seconds. We're going to cool those feet a little bit, brother. We're going to do a drink bottle as well. Yeah, so they're tweaking this car. It's a rear ride height. Thanks, guys. Make sure we've got those safety stands. Okay, it's about 10 more seconds approximately. Go, go. Clear instructions from Mark Dutton. When he says safety stands, he's talking about the jack stands under the car. They're not permitted to work on the car without those in there to prevent any accidental fall. Yes, Scafie, you're onto it. You saw Shane Van Gisbergen. and I was watching under the left wheel here. They got in under there, put the jack stands in. That's the regulations if you're going to put your hands under the wheel arch. What they did in there, they wound the spring platform, the spring on the shock absorber. They undid it, lengthening that shock absorber. Do you know, mate, put a little bit more droop in the car, so maybe they've got a little bit too much turn, a bit too much bite, and they want to settle that down. And just a little issue for James Golding with his pit stop. They actually were making a change to the rear of that car, and they dropped that car with the safety stand still underneath. So a bit of a hesitation before they were able to get that car back going again. That's why the call was being made by Mark Dutton to help manage that. This is Brown. Courtney and Slade in here too. So what oh, Brown and done. Courtney have That's in terms of comparative fuel forward. there? 23 litres for Courtney and 22 litres for Brown. So they come in line astern and they had the same almost exactly within a litre at their previous stop. So they should go back down again the same way. Yeah. On our real time numbers is 33.2, place 33.1. Payne's got six seconds now over Brock Feeney. So roughly a third of the field have taken their second stop. They're fueled to the end. We know that from yesterday's knowledge that tyre life's pretty good, although there's a little bit more blue sky and direct light out there on the racetrack at the moment. Now, Thomas Randall doing what he did yesterday. He's come into the pit lane and he's come in a little earlier than the rest. It's uh, lap number 48, and that's exactly what he did yesterday. And Anton Di Pasquale and Mark Winterbottom go with him. This is, I remember I talked about the arrival into pit lane. So Courtney and Brown getting into it, into the lane. So that was wild. And then what's a great mystery. So this is wild. So we've been talking about it all week. Again, you say how hard it is to get in there. It's very hard when you try to get in there together. <laughs> the second part is that they had on our numbers almost exactly the same amount of fuel to go. Courtney's miles in front of him. So I don't know what's happened to Will Brown then in terms of fuel feed or some other problem in that stop. But Will Brown has lost a huge amount of ground to James Courtney. Four positions. Close on exit here for Anton, but he just gets out of car length in front of Thomas. So these second stops, you'll see the cars static for a much longer period of time for the vast majority as they take the best part of 60, 70 litres in most cases. And here's a pit lane entry no, he's actually sidestepped deliberately. Was that an issue or was that deliberate? And I think that was Gizzy giving way to Brock no, there. Once you stop on the Why would they do that? Because uh, one... Because this is now the third stop for Van Gisberg. So he's got to have a problem. And that's... Yeah, so it wasn't an entry issue. He's just steered wide to give space to Brock, who is a contender. And, and did they underfill Van Gisberg? And I can't do the numbers yet because we haven't got them, they haven't come through. But for Shane to move over and let Brock by, this 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 is massive. Remember the team championship, Lucker. Okay, so Brock a big drink of fuel, and they did that front anti roll bar adjustment. Let's see what's going on. Shane, now they've re-tightened the wheels. I wonder if he said one of his wheels is loose. All the boys did here was whack the guns back on and give them a tighten. I, honestly, I, I can't work that out at all. Well done, like, I, I don't know how that works, but yeah. so this is what happened, this is what you saw. Yeah, so to begin with, I thought it was an overshoot, but it was actually clearing space for his teammate. 
Now, what's probably happened is he's reported something that doesn't feel right in the car. He's looked in the mirror or they've told him that Brock's coming. He's cleared the smoke. Brock's got the cone marker on the way in there as well, trying to get to the right of the other car because you don't expect to have another car alongside you in that process as Reynolds pits and Brody Kostecki as well. So good presence of mind by Van Gisbergen to give clear air or maybe nudged on the radio. Yeah, and they've uh, rattled the wheels and tyres back up tight on that car. Well, that was very respectful and nicely done by Van Gisbergen. But the, the weirdness of it is that he had a massively long fuel stop, didn't he? Because he only put 12 and a half litres on at the first stop. So if you've got a very long fuel stop, then there's no pressure on the tyre or the wheel change. So for it not to be tensioned is strange. Yeah, and it was quite sharp of Shane to come in. He, Andrew Edwards just told me, he said that he felt something wobbling. So they have come in, Mark, to tighten that wheel, but here you can see the boys are back out on the lane again. So that was clever of him to get out of the way for Brock and let that happen, but he came in unannounced. They didn't know it was coming, so he must have picked it up at the last minute and dived in. So let's see what happens here. They've got the guns out. Look like they're going to have another crack. Well, he's going slowly, like a, you haven't probably seen the screen near where you are, but he's just trundling around slowly at the moment. So there's something else that's going on. So they've come in, retentioned the wheels, thinking that that might be it. But he's just going slowly now. In fact, it looked like it may have a gear lever or a gear selection issue, because he just plucked two or three gears at the same time then. But he's going very slowly on the entrance to the pit area. Remember, this car got harmed yesterday and had to have a fair bit of surgery done to it. So trundling back into the lane. I've got to inspect the outside first, and then if we uh, see an issue, we'll take it to the garage. Down, mate. Three across now, centre on the board. Thanks, mate. So, from what Mark reported before, great presence of mind by Van Gisbergen to get out of the way because the team didn't know he was coming. So, he moved it out of the way on purpose to let Brock Feeney by. So this is. Yeah, and all the evidence is there, isn't it? Of something loose. The boys grabbing all the parts. They don't know what they're looking for. They're just wobbling. But look at this. Look at the build-up on the tyre. That's massive build-up. And sometimes we all know as ex-drivers that build-up can give you the sensation. There's something coming loose. There's something wobbly. I wonder if it's that. Yeah, build-up can literally fooled into thinking that there's something catastrophic going on with the car. Now, Waters is in. This is a key stop for these guys. So, meantime, Van Gisbergen just in front of him down the lane trying to investigate what the problem is. Mirror out. Left mirror out there, Cordell. That's a good move to fix the mirror while they were there. Left mirror out. Yeah, look at that. That's smart. on fuel, Ryan Jury. When we drop waters, we are clear. 27 seconds, very close now. Get ready. Go, 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 go. Like a nice job, fairly straightforward. So that's second stop now completed for Cam Waters. So we've only got three cars in the field. Matt Payne, Chas Most and Cam Hill that are yet to take their final stop of the day. Remembering that Payne had margin presently on target to clinch not only his first podium, but the very likely possibility that if it all goes well in the final stint here, he might be able to stitch together a race victory. Now, meantime, Van Gisbergen, as we were focused on, Cam has departed the pit lane. And car number eight, Andre Heimgartner, is going to get a bad sportsmanship flag for exceeding track limits. It's a cool shot of the racetrack precinct, the Adelaide Parklands, and how close the Adelaide CBD is off to the edge of the racetrack. And up the end of Wakefield Street, you're virtually right in the city fringe when you get to turn four. Beautiful view as Chas Mostert now comes in from second position. It's dry ice for the driver cooling system going in and a tear off also being released off the front of that car. They've stuck about five of those on for the longer races. Okay. Door is shut on 20 seconds, mate. 
lane's clear in the minute. When it drops, it's right to go. Be ready. Be ready for it. Go, go, go. Now I can see behind them also at Penrite Racing. Looked like they were standing by there for Matt Payne. I think Garth was lurking around down there to keep an eye on that one when it does happen. So key stop for them. Got to be executed with perfection, and here he is on cue. Oh, mate, he's going in the lane there, mate. Matt Good Payne brings it into pit lane for his final stop of the Sunday afternoon, Adelaide 500. The important thing right here is to get it stopped on the mark so they can get the fuel rig on. On the mark, nicely, fuel rig's connected. They've got time, the fuel will cover the tyres. You can see two brand new tyres going on the working side of the car. Two very lightly roaded tyres going on the non-working side. They'll do a windscreen tear off to give him a nice clear vision. A drink bottle. Matty Payne's hit, nodding the head. He's got the communications now. It's just a countdown. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Ten seconds to go. Remember yesterday, he had a bad race. They didn't use a lot of tyres, so he's had great tyre banks for this one. Think about the pressure. He's got to launch it out of here. He does that nicely. Good job, Matt Payne. Firing, uh, there was a round of applause in the garage in the background there too. They were firing some cool air into those black ducts. Now he's potentially going to sail on home from this position with a margin. Yep. So if he has a mistake free run here to the flag, he's got this. He's got to negotiate traffic, he's got to negotiate the continued build up. But this might be something of a carbon copy as what happened last year to Brock, yeah. where there was a youngster breakthrough. A very special day to conclude the Adelaide 500 for a new hero of the sport. Mark Dutton, team manager down here, mate. We're intrigued, wondering, probably like I guess you are. I see a lot of build-up on the tyres. What do you make of it? Yeah, these these tyres are really tough to, to tell the difference between build-up or sometimes a loose wheel. Uh, we've had the car in, obviously, multiple times. You've seen that. And safety first, obviously. He's dropped positions. We're not trying to do uh, world record pit stops. So we inspected the car thoroughly. We can't see any damage to suspension, etc., or any loose wheels on the first stop or the subsequent ones. So we we'll put on another set of tyres, uh, and we'll, we'll just wait for his feedback now. All right, thank you, mate. And I'll just quickly try and see. Look at this build-up that I'm talking about. You can see what Mark's talking about. Check this out. Like that, I can literally peel it off. So imagine what you're going around a corner and that must feel like look at it there's the actual tire under there i can just keep doing this that's amazing isn't it all right guys i went and checked in with uh, tom moore engineer for wheel brown just to see what happened in that pit stop he confirmed slightly slow fuel flow but they were also a little bit conservative on the fuel drop they wanted to make sure they got it all done just ticking boxes for that team's championship thanks for that jack and for mark so it's a 6.3 second margin now that it's distilled in the second stops between Payne and Feeney. Talking about pickup, it's a bit of an industry term. So just to backpedal on that one, see all the rubber that's flanked all around this racetrack at the moment when you've got a hot race tire and there's cold bits of rubber around. The tyre literally grabs it and it adheres to the tread face. And the reason why it's so disconcerting as a driver is it sits up on the tread face and then it moves around and it gives the impression that something's failed in the car. The car moves all over the place, so you get this enormous instability. And there are certain tracks, certain tyre compounds uh, where build-up can be a real problem at certain times of the day. And that's why when a safety car comes out, you'll often hear the engineers on the radio in the background counselling the drivers to make sure that they stay on the racing line, don't start winding left and right in search of tyre temperature and pressure and accidentally end up with a pile of pickup because when you get going again at the commencement of the stint all of a sudden it feels weird. You can literally fall off the edge of the road. Totally and the, and the other part is it doesn't always get adhered to the surface of the road in terms of the tyre evenly. So sometimes it can actually happen in a, in a part of the tyre or a spot of the tyre that makes it vibrate. Like you got a wheel out of balance. Yep. Mostert and Randall getting together down here at the moment for 8th and ninth. So before the last stops, Neil, you basically said Matt Payne had a gap of five seconds roughly over the field. And fuel in hand. And that's now come out at six and a half. Yep. Up the inside, or is he? Becomes the outside down here. So Randall's trying to offer up manoeuvres here at the moment, but you've got to try and thread that needle. Lost a little bit of ground getting off turn six there, and Van Gisbergen is back in the lane. So whatever the issue is with that car, 
the Triple Eight Race Engineering Group will have another look at that just to see whether there's something more sinister than pickup. In fact, it's in the garage. Thomas lost a bit of ground that time. He's going to have to wind him back in like a fish once again. When you lose that ground, when you make your manoeuvre and you make a little mistake, it's a curse because you don't just get it back. You've just got to eke it back very slowly. Sometimes it takes several laps to get you back to where you once were. Because invariably, whomever you're racing, pretty good at their job. Yes. And they don't <laughs> give the space away in a hurry. Heimgartner now, position number five. Not a, not a bad run, a decent run here for Brad Jones Racing R&J Batteries entry. And he's just in front of our champ elect who's winding down now with 22 to go to be formally crowned as the Repco Supercars Championship of this season. So this Heimgartner drive has got Brad Jones racing back to third in the team's championship. Two laps remaining. Everybody's done their second compulsory stop. It's a blast to the flag now. Is it going to be a clean run? Might there be a safety car? Or is Matt Payne staring down the gun barrel at the possibility of not only his first podium, but potentially a first victory in his young career? We're focused on the battle here for fifth and sixth. Heimgartner on screen, RJ Battery's entry, and he's got Brody Kostecki tucked in behind him. Just beyond them at the moment is Anton Di Pasquale, who's managed to claw up into the top ten. He's up seven spots from his qualifying position. Chas Mostert's just drifted a little from Thomas Randall. Uh, Will Davis in the ten, and just outside the ten is Hazelwood. So, good drive by Andre Heimgartner today. Forged his way forward. He made it into the Armourall top ten shootout. And then he's been playing with the heavyweights at the pointy end of the field, and he's been able to make ground. So David Reynolds, at the moment, at the front of the field, has been the man of the match with seven positions gained. And then Heimgartner with four, Dick Squally with seven also. It's a pretty healthy battle going on there. There's that pickup that you spoke of. If you run over that, then obviously that's the thing that binds its way to the tyre as Brody had a little look down the inside of Andre there at turn seven. Seen a bit of action there today already. That was a, wasn't just a tiny bit of pickup. It was a massive chunk of it. It was a blob. Yeah. Well, it would have come out. It would have in a guard. jumped out of the car after it hit the kerb at turn five. So as you've got all of that pickup being built up in the inner guard of the cars. When you spear over a curb, sometimes it just gets dislodged like that, and that's what would have happened with that particular ball of pickup that was on the road where we saw it. It's about 60 kilometres of racing to go in our championship this year. 60 kilometres separating Matt Payne from the possibility of a pretty important victory. They'll be starting to tense up down there in that Penrite Racing Garage at the prospect of this. Because first, it would have been, can he get off the line? Then it would be, can he hold him at bay in the first stint? And then it's, can we execute the first stop? And then it's, can we hold him at bay in the second stint? Now can we execute the second stop? So they're just gradually going down the checklist and getting things done. And now they're into the phase of the race where it'll be hard for them to tear their eyes off the timing monitor and off the screens. Now Brody winding himself back into contention here. Lost it right under the rear bumper of Anton Di Pasquale. And Thomas Randall, you can see him just off in the distance there in the background. Jumping on with Chaz now, turn eight. Just on the fastest lap of the race on a 20.1, Chaz, and he did it on lap 54. So just after, oh, and down the inside. That would have been just after his second stop. Yeah. He had young tyres on the car. It's got pace, but not track position. Brody's just backed out of this battle a little bit with Heimgartner. He's just pulled back three quarters of a second, a few car lengths. And he'll have a bit more Great thought. Work, 19 to go, and you've got four-month pressure tires. That's the second four-month pressure. So that's Adam Gabore, and that's one of the relationships that we won't see at the start of 2024 with Adam 
moving on. And that means that little bit of information there was pretty good communication as Van Gisbergen gets going again. Good communication to say that your tyres are four laps better. And I've just touched base with the team at Shell V Power Racing in regards to Will Davison's pit stop. They were expecting to come out around fifth or sixth, but they've had an issue with their fuel flow, so that's dropped him way down the order to in tenth position. Shane Van Gisbergen is just a part of the pit lane again. I spoke to Jamie Winkup. He said, look, we actually don't know. So they just changed rear shocks and springs as a precaution because the last thing you want to do is leave this event and not have that question answered. So I'll use it a bit of a test and see if they can get to the bottom of what's going on. I've got to say, that build-up looks bad. Yeah, don't want to be running off the race line at the moment. And uh, pretty much like the way in which it unfolded yesterday, late in the race, and... Uh, Lots more blue sky lurking around out there at the moment, so there might be a little bit more tyre hurt today than there was yesterday. Last lap for Matt Payne, for example, was a 20.5, though, and the best lap he's done in the race a 20.4, so might have to eat my words. Not very much variance in that. 20.6, the last lap for Brock, and a 20.5 was his peak. So there's very small delta between best and current. Yep. And nothing between the top four. So 20.6, 20.6, 20 20.5. And a point in case here, Matt's about to do potentially his personal best lap because he's just gone out and gone faster in sector one than he's done for the rest of the race. Austin's got some pretty decent pressure going here at the moment on the back of Kostecki. He might have a little bit of a nibble down the bottom of the hairpin. Let's see whether or not he's close enough through turn eight quite a few car lengths behind here at the moment but often you can do the diagonal down the other end here certainly making ground but not enough to be able to affect the pass and that's Heimgartner in the distance in the RJ batteries entry a few shadows starting to appear down there as you size up where you want to place the car down there at 10 and 11 it's a good pick up there with Rihanna and Will Davison because I was Race control Very confused. Teams, bad sportsmanship flags to cars 9 and 11 for exceeding track limits. 9 and 11, so Anton Di Pasquale and Will Brown have been given the bad sportsmanship flag there from race control. But I was very confused because Will Davison and Shane Van Gisbergen were essentially on the same strategy with less than a litre difference from their first stop. And Will dropped massively to Shane when they first come out after the second stop. So I, I couldn't work that out. I still can't get my brain around why Will, why Will was so much, Will Brown, I'm saying, was so much away from Courtney also. It's starting to heat up again, this little trio. Got a bit of elastic going. They're closer and then further apart and then closer again. So Brody's got decent pace here on the run into turn eight. Equal performance through the middle of the corner. And now has a lunge under brakes down. He's pretty strong here. Right to the rear bumper of Heimgartner out of the hairpin. This point of the day that's also starting to get pretty heavy duty physical wise as well. Yep. But he's done 250 Ks yesterday, been in the car. On and off since Thursday, Brad Jones keeping an eye on proceedings in the garage down there, and the fellow with the mask on is yeah. Phil Keed. He's the engineer for Bryce Fullwood. Brad's the owner of the car in front there, r &J Batteries entry. Heimgartner. And so you feel it in the small of your back and uh, in your legs, particularly with the big braking applications, and it's a big pedal pressure and a big push when you get down to turn nine. And there's a big push going on here at the moment with Kostecki. He's having a real nibble now on the back of Heimgartner. So look for him to try and make a move. If he can be close enough through turn eight, he's not going to get him here at seven. But if he can shadow him through eight, he will have a lunge when they get down to the hairpin at turn nine. He's right under him. He's closer this time. A much better opportunity to be able to have a lash. So tries to stay with him. They're very even through here. But when we saw the chopper shot from above last time, you can see how strong he was under brakes. And he has a big dive. So much so that he overcooks it. Runs wide. Brody Kostecki drops two spots in that manoeuvre. He's lost ground. He was nibbling away on the back of Heimgartner. 
Mossed it behind him, and he's lost two spots. Di Pasquale also having got by, so he's locked the rears. It was a big, big lunge. He was energised to do it in the run through turn eight, and then uh, he knew that he wasn't going to be able to pull it up. You could see it got the wriggles on under brakes, and he released the brake pedal, dropped two spots. So Boston and Di Pasquale get by. Kostecki drops back into eighth position, but A for effort. Well, it was he was going to drill the back of Andre's car, wasn't he? Yeah. So he just very gently moved the steering, just a little bit of left-hand steering input, and released some brake pressure and ran wide but it was certainly better than trying to get it into the corner because if he turned in to turn nine, then he was definitely going to make contact with Andre Heimgartner. Now, mostert has been very good here through the weekend. Just see whether he can get a little run. Not really, not much of a gain there at all, but he's also quite strong in the braking area. And the two principal spots that Moss has been using has been the Turn 9 hairpin or the area off Turn 13 on the approach to the final corner at Turn 14. And this one here, up and over the inside curve and getting it stopped. Great shot from our chopper cam there. Adelaide, South Australia, congratulations to everybody involved. South Australian Motorsport Board, the Premier and all of the government support, everybody that's been so supportive of this event. It hasn't just been reintroduced, this event has been completely reinvigorated. And the overlay and the spend and the look and the vibe and the atmosphere of this weekend is just one of a kind. It's just absolutely fantastic. And the patrons are here by plenty. That cover over the grandstand that the Premier spoke to Mark Brewer about before the start of the race. It's just another one of the features of this year and congratulations to everybody who's been involved. What an unbelievable event. 7.2 seconds now to get pain over Feeney as everybody enjoys some late spring sunshine here in Adelaide. First time we've seen it this weekend. Beautiful afternoon out there now and still a few little battles to resolve. This is one of them. Nice battle going on for fifth and sixth between Andre Heimgartner and Chaz Mostert. And stalking just in the background is Anton Di Pasquale in the Shell V-Power Racing entry. But Chaz has got that thing wriggling under brakes. Now Anton is also Max attack in the braking area there and he just ran ever so slightly wide. Great pressure, buddy. Keep it up. They need to go. 13 laps remain. So first, second and third looking relatively safe at the moment. Reynolds, quieter run for him in third at the moment. He's got a margin of just under four seconds over Cam Waters. And this is where the focus lies at the moment. The battle pack very definitely in this spot. And Mostert looks strong through here, doesn't he? Uh, so uh, I think Heimgarten is just having a bit of a battle pulling that thing up. It just hasn't quite got the tyre grip in a couple of spots, nor does it have the traction. You can see it there. So Chaz now gets it down the inside. He may even get it done before they get to turn eight. Now, there's a right of way rule here, much like there is at the Gold Coast, but he's got it done by the time he got to the 150 mark. Did he rub it? Did he rub it? That was close. That was close. And Anton's right in here as well. If there was any space on the outside there, I'll be surprised. I think he might have given the fence a rub for sure, Neil. And I think that they're all blowing up on the radio with Andre that he was further along from that point of discretion. The point that you were making is roughly 150 metres before the corner, you've got to be at least level on the inside. And he turns oh. it in. Oh, my God, that was close. Yeah, oh, we've got to get the front to shot to be able to see. Here we go. Look at the slide that he's got going. He's in the marbles. Oh, oh. that was a feeler gauge. <laughs> that was a feeler gauge. Oh, it was about two thou between the left rear and the concrete wall. Whoa. Oh. Adam's like, whew. Yeah, so that'll be the reason. Actually, the, the chopper shot wasn't as damning. No. But when we're back on the ground, that was late in the game there. That was the reason why Heimgartner lit up on the radio. They were having a drag race on their run down there. But 
The other part about all that was that when Mozzie got it done, he was out there in Never Never Land yeah. because he was on those marbles that we've been describing. So he only scrambled out the other side of that one just. Well, it compromised the turning, didn't it? It was actually oh. narrow on the way to the corner, but he was wide on the way out. And that was the thing. He threw it in there and he was going to do it no matter what. Yep. There was no talking him out of that one. Just lost it up to position number five in that swift manoeuvre from Heimgartner. Then Di Pasquale Kostecki now in eighth position. Still not be much between these four cars. Only a couple of seconds blanketing them for these minor positions. Thomas Randall's not too far off the tow rope either. And then further afield there, you had a glimpse of Will Davison. 7.1 seconds. Next time through, it'll be 10 to go. Matt Payne drawing every millimetre closer to the chequered flag here and a breakthrough victory. What a moment that's going to be if, in fact, it unfolds. Now, Chaz has been able to just move away slightly. This is opening up an opportunity for Di Pasquale now to try and do something similar, perhaps without the nail biting involved. So Anton now right under the back. See that rubber flailing off the cars on the run down towards turn eight here. Di Pasquale sizes him up. Is he going to have a crack when they get down here under brakes? This is where Heimgarten has been just a little bit vulnerable, but Di Pasquale just stays in the queue for the moment. He's got the lights on. Here we are with Andre. That's Chaz just skipping down the road slightly. Now looking rearward off the rear bumper of Heimgartner's car. And this is looking back at Di Pasquale. And he doesn't look like he's got quite as much energy in the car. Oh, Thomas ran wide the brake approach to the final corner there. Doesn't look like he's got quite the pace that Mostert had Di Pasquale. He hasn't got quite the energy, it seems, in those tyres or in the balance of the car to be able to stick a move together but he is stalking him, he's not far away from him. He lost a little bit of ground on that one. In fact, he might be a tiny bit vulnerable here to Brody Kostecki. Brody now got the incentive to be able to see whether or not he can put something together here. They're all on the knife edge, aren't they? There's not much left here at the moment for anybody when it comes to absolute grip and lap pace. They've got every last little bit of performance being squeezed out of these things at the back end of this race with 10 to go. Did you see Thomas Randall then in the back of that shot? He was completely sideways. He had the whole car up on top of the kerb coming out of turn seven. And there was about the same gap that you that you recounted from Mostert at turn eight. There was about the same gap with Thomas Randall against the fence coming out of turn seven. And he had that moment at the final corner as well. There he is in the green and white car, the Castrol entry. He's just one and a half seconds off Kostecki at the moment. Speaking of, we join him here at the final turn. Gives you a good view of the pit lane. Grandstand off to the side. Here's the pit lane blend right here. And that's a tricky one to negotiate. We saw some wild manoeuvres both yesterday and today. Part of the line taking through the centre S now is also to negotiate the rubber chunks. Yeah, to see the amount of build-up that was parked on the left-hand side out of turn one through turn two. And then this is where we saw that other big chunk on the side of the road here at turn five. So this is Matt Payne, and he has roughly seven and a half seconds. What was that that uh, came off Jack's car? Was that a bit of the inner guard? Because it surely couldn't have been that much rubber. I didn't, I didn't see. I was looking for the gap there to Brock Feeney. Brock Feeney is then two and a half seconds, or just over two seconds in front of David. Oh, the oh, run over that piece. Something, something on the road down there. Ask and thou shalt receive. So, a bit of junk on the edge of the road. Smith did the right thing there, gave him tons of space, our race leader, who's still got more than seven seconds in hand over Brock Feeney. Eight laps to go. How's the tension in the garage down at Penrite Racing, I'm wondering. There'll be a bit of nail biting going on down there at the moment, friends and family. There'll be a lot of Kiwi viewers on the other side of the pond watching this one and enjoying it as well. We're going to stay with him here for a tick. This one will... Thank you, guys. 
have a drink for me, so I'm probably a buyer, last one for Brock, 21 to 1. Stay with him and have a look and see what the work rate looks like. Jack Bell, the engineer, David Couchy is the team principal down there. They've been working really hard with this fellow in the early part of the year. Teams, bad sportsmanship, flag to car 43 for exceeding track limits. Cam Waters, had to adjust our brains this weekend to the number 43 on Cam's car. So back looking over the shoulder of Matt here. Let's just stay with him. Made that little adjustment on the brake bias control. It's that fluorescent knob that you can see that allows you to change the brake percentage front to rear on the car. The quick adjustment of those brake biases that we've had in years gone by has now disappeared. So it's back to the old rotary knob. And they get a corresponding number on the dashboard for where that brake bias is. Sometimes you change that on multiple occasions through the race as the tyres wear and the fuel load changes. The track conditions alter. This car looks good, Mark, and he's driving it well. I saw him make a little catch up at turn seven the rest of the time. It's all looking pretty comfortable. We've got six laps remaining. It's about 18 kilometres that separates him from the biggest victory of his career. And he's got 7.5 seconds over Brock Feeney. Nobody can throw a punch at him, and they've not done that from the start of the race. He's just been squeaking away a millimetre at a time. And we've got 73 laps in the bank. And it looks like he could close this deal. He just has beautiful rhythm going, momentum, hasn't he? The other part that's really impressive is... Six to go, mate. Six to go. When you're listening... Last lap for Brock, 21 0 21-0. Behind 7.7. Yeah, well done. So again, that communication is really concise. It's informative to the point where he knows his own number. He knows go the gap back to the previous car and what sort of speed each lap that Brock Feeney's doing. The other thing that's when we're on board with him that's really evident is how nicely it puts the power down. So on the way out of every corner, you can hear the throttle modulation and the way that. He progresses the throttle on the way out of those slow corners, and when he does it, it accepts that throttle. He, I never heard once the burst of wheel spin. <laughs> so he's patting the desk there, and it's his son Brendan on his right-hand side, camera left for us. So now it's five laps to go. They can't tear their eyes away from this. What a moment. It's a big investment when you put a youngster in the car, and there's a risk involved in that as well. Because sometimes, They've got to make a couple of mistakes along the way in order to be able to find their feet, and that can be costly for a team owner. But the faith is now being rewarded with a beautiful execute this afternoon by Matt Payne. Less than five laps remaining for him now. He's got the margin even further out. He's stretching the lead. It's nearly eight seconds now. And Jack's talking to him on the radio in the straight lines only, down here or out the other side. There's no need to disturb him. He's well focused at the moment. I just heard Dave Reynolds ask the team, is Matt, is Matt Payne going to get the win? Yeah. <laughs> well, there are occasions at certain tracks where you can actually see big screens around where you can keep a bit of an eye on what's going on. You can see the totem or you can see either your teammate or your opponents in various parts of the racetrack. Bit of a waiter here to see who's where. Payne, Feeney, Reynolds, Waters, Boston, Heimgarten, Deep Pasquale, Kostecki and Randall. Then Davis and Hazel with Courtney on screen, followed by Scott Pye right there. And then Will Brown down in 14th. Quiet run for him this afternoon. Then Mark Winterbottom. Dewalt entry. 
and then a fair margin you can see back to Tim Slade here in the Newlon racing car. A little less than four laps remaining now. We're counting down to the back end of the Repco Supercars Championship. This is the 12th and final event of the year. It's the 28th race in the sequence that's taken us to this point. Bryce Forward, who's re-signed with Middies Electrical and Brad Jones Racing with a new contract at that outfit. That was announced just in this past week. And here comes Matt Payne one more time, threading his way through these marbles. He's going to really keep his concentration up now. So easy to make a mistake around this place. A digital panel just in behind the windscreen with a number one on it. There'll be lots of still photography being shot around the place as well. And he'll save us some of these images when he gets to look at them when he gets home or when he's a little older down the road because if he does put this together, this is one for the scrapbook. And you made the point early in the race about how powerful this was for Brock Feeney last year to get his breakthrough debut win as the final race of the year at such a massive event, one of the biggest events within our championship and to do the same this year effectively for Matt Payne, the young Kiwi, to have this gravity, the magnitude of this win is absolutely huge in Australian motorsport and for the young Kiwi to be able to do that, very, very important for him and a life-changing day for Matt Payne. Been a nice run today for Cam here as well because uh, he dropped a bit of ground but he's come back that opening stint looked like it was a battle for him. He's up doing an awesome job. Less than three laps remain, he is doing an awesome job. The always moments in a driver's career where there's self-doubt. There were some challenges earlier in the championship season for him. And there would have been some frustrations. But what this does, once he closes the deal, it's confirmation that it can be done. And then that does change his mindset and the way in which he approaches future races. Doesn't look like he's too hot and flustered in the car as he was lining up through turn 13 into the final corner. This time through, it's just two laps to go. It's a little over six kilometres of racing. He's got 8.6 seconds now as a margin. He's continuing to pull away. He's actually just done his personal best in the mid-sector. Yeah. He's actually pushing. So he did 20.1 in the mid-sector. And again, referring to qualifying earlier today, it was high 19s that people were doing in the mid-sector when they were going well. So when you do a 20.1 in that middle sector, which is the area between turn six and seven and the braking area down here at nine. That's a pretty decent run. Little awkward moment up and over the curbing on the other side for Thomas Randall. He's dropped down into 10th place as a result of that. And we come back and pick up Matt one more time. Next time round, it is going to be one lap to go. This is going to be a beauty. The whole new deal, so not only have we Seal a fresh, a new, a vibrant and exciting champion for 2023. But we're going to have another fellow that we add to the list of winners here. What an extraordinary story it's been so far this championship year. There's been a number of drivers that have achieved this year. Brody's been the best in the queue for race wins, but this fellow's going to add his name to Kostecki, Feeney, Van Gisbergen, and Brown, Waters, Di Pasquale, LeBrock, Reynolds and Winterbottom have all won races. And now there's the prospect of another. So here we go. This time through on that control line right there, it is one lap to go. 3,220 metres of racetrack. He's got to get between all the dirt and the grot either side of the racing line and not make a misstep, not lock a brake, not wander off line, not drop his concentration. Turn four and our five executed. No need to over hustle it. He's got 8.9 seconds in hand. It can be a nice, gentle, easy run on this final lap. Turn seven for the, t the last time. Last lap, buddy. Last lap, mate. <laughs> and he showed this pace yesterday, didn't he? He did. And that's why I was yeah. looking forward to seeing what he could do today. He was so frustrated to get caught up in all the trouble in yesterday's race. Down to the tricky and critical turn nine now for the last time. and out the other side. 
Stephen Grove can barely contain himself. They're going to wind themselves into a frenzy at Penrite Racing for this one. Gigantic investment for Stephen and Brenton Grove. Millions of dollars on the line to make it all happen. Into the final corner at the end of 78 laps for Penrite Racing. He's 21 years of age and Matt Payne joins the list of winners in Supercar Racing for the Baylor Adelaide 500 and a brilliant breakthrough win. Came to this event as a Supercar rookie. in second place. Another brilliant Sunday drive here for him. He was the winner last year and David Reynolds making it one and three for Penrite in his final run for Grove Racing. And there officially is our supercar champion of 2023. What a moment. The numbers scream success for Brody. A breakthrough win this year at the AGP. 18 podium visits more than any other driver this season. Ten armour all poles, six race wins. Great job, everyone. Really a debut at Bathurst only as far back as 2019 in a very short frame of time. He's become the man to beat. 5,360 kilometres later, Brody Kostecki is officially the Repco Supercars champion. Yeah. What a moment for these men and women down here, though, at Penrite. And a great moment also for them at Coca-Cola Racing and at Erebus. <laughs> Don't headbutt each other, please. No. It's got danger written all over it. <laughs> Certainly. What an extraordinary performance when it mattered most at the back end of the year. So first and third for Matt Payne, for David Reynolds. Brock Feeney in the middle there for the Red Bull Ampole Racing team. And this man now can officially sigh a sigh of relief. He is the champion. He's done a beautiful job this year. His application, his work, his dedication to the technical craft, the way in which he's conducted himself, the way he's handled things with us, the way he's worked within that team, it's been an absolute pleasure. So fantastic to see the way in which he's been able to put it together and all congratulations go to Brody Kostecki. Been a remarkable year for Brody and a great response by everybody there at Coca-Cola Racing by Erebus because that team have been superb. And Brody Kostecki, sincere congratulations on what has been a standout season. And here he is in front of everybody to celebrate. success this year. She's supposed to wipe that on the fence then. <laughs> I tell you what he nearly did. Yeah. He very nearly got the trophy. Yeah, he almost knocked it over when he first parked it. And Brody Kostecki in front of all the fans. This amazing atmosphere, this arena. Those Dunlop rear tyres are very good now. No. You won't get another lap out of those. Slightly used. Honestly, I was looking out the combox window at how close he went to getting the plinth and the championship trophy. He's now down in <laughs> Pertec Victory Lane. 
and I thought for all money that he was going to swat it. This is going to be lots of fun, Jess. It sure is, Neil. It doesn't get better than this. The Perth Tech Victory Lane is awesome. And Adelaide has a way of announcing stars of the future. Matty Payne making his way straight to the stop step in his rookie year. This is an overwhelming moment, I can tell. Yeah. Talk me through it. How are you feeling? It's, um, it's so good. I got no words. I got no words. It's, um, it's so awesome, you know. Got to thank the whole Penrite Racing crew. They've um, they've tried so hard this season. We've all been trying. We've worked so hard to get to this point, and I finally think we've got some really good pace in both these cars. So um, it's been so good. Special thanks to the Groves. They've um, you know they believed in me when they first first put me in Super Two, and it's definitely paid off now. So it's um, so good, so good. K19 was all in the mail, all in the mail. Yeah. Talk me through that start. It was a blinder today, and that really made the difference. To be out in front, how was Jack coaching you through a 250Ks here on the mean streets of Adelaide? Yeah, it was a really good start, actually. I sort of just went for it. I saw Brody was kind of next to me, and I kind of got the jump on him. So it was uh, it was go, all go for turn one. I was I was in, I was into it. I was going to get the lead, and um, yeah, it was uh, Jack was so good, you know, calm. It didn't matter. It didn't feel like it mattered if we were first or we were 15th. He was just calm and uh, so much help through the race. So awesome. So awesome. <laughs> Go and celebrate the moment. Congratulations. Your first ever win in supercars. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And a ripping drive from Brock Feeney, who's been brilliant this year. Congratulations. I know how disappointed you were with qualifying and missing yeah. the top 10 yesterday. To come out here and put on that performance was an absolute ripper. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome to be back. Man, I love this joint here. Um, it feels like home, but um, seeing Maddie wins awesome. It, it's literally deja vu to 12 months ago to myself. So congrats to him and his team um, for believing in a young kid like my team did. So awesome job to them. But my team did a fantastic job all year. I think we've showed um, we've got the pace and, and we've ended the year on a positive note again. You've really ridden the roller coaster of supercars yeah. this year, haven't you? The highest of highs and there's been some really disappointing days too, but you finished the year third in the championship. How does that feel? Yeah, thanks. It sounds awesome. Um, look, it's been a roller coaster the last couple of rounds and even on Friday, I was just like, when is something going to go my way? It just, um, but um, to bounce back today and, and have a great result, the car was fantastic today and yesterday. So thanks to the team, uh, it's, been a, it's been an awesome year, a big step up from last year, and um, we're looking forward to bringing it next year. Can't wait to see you then. Enjoy the podium today, Brock. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. And David Reynolds, his fourth consecutive podium. He's had a rocket here this weekend, and it's great to see him back on the podium with the family and all, yeah. Davey. Congratulations. I know there was a lot of emotion wrapped up in this weekend with the team. How are you feeling after that one? Yeah, I feel pretty good. Um, I just can't believe Matt won. That's just an unbelievable performance. Like, he's been threatening to do that, you know, all weekend, almost qualifying pole, and, you know, he's been so fast since he turned up here, so he just thoroughly deserves it. He puts a lot of effort into his job. Um, even though he doesn't seem like, you know... He's, he's all there, he's, he's all there. He's a, he's a clever little fella. But uh, we love him and uh, yeah, it's, it's a magical performance by the whole team. To have finished, to finish on such a high, double podium. Yeah, I started 10, so you know, had a really good race. So, last podium for the season. What can we expect up there, Davey? Uh, well, I didn't win, so <laughs> probably nothing. So I don't know, I might, might take my little boy up and see if he wants to have a go. Maybe not a shoey, but. Maybe we'll figure something out. Not for all you. Congratulations on an epic uh, finish to the season. Go and enjoy it with the team. Thanks, Jess. Can I have a hug? <laughs> David Reynolds. He's not that is there. one unique creature right there. So uh, imagine, uh, imagine being described as not all there by your teammate. Brody Kostecki, though. Back into Pertic Victory Lane here and the focus shifting from those that have done a marvellous job today to be first, second and third. Back to Brody, who stitched it together across the championship season. <laughs> Started all the way back in Newcastle. How's the amphitheatre? It's cool, isn't it? Isn't it? Thank you. 
I just need to find my little bit of pink paper that had a phone number on it out there. <laughs> Crew have been wearing these t-shirts through the day and now Brody gets his going there as well. Nathan Kayser is down there as well and uh, Jess is down in amongst it. She'll make her way through the confetti and the celebrations and we'll hear some more from Brody who's just done an epic job this afternoon. It's a really emotional and a very, very special moment for him and all of the men and women in that outfit. It certainly is. What a moment down here in the Pertec Victory Lane for our 2023 Repco Supercars champion, Brody Kostecki. Really happened. Has it sunk in? Is it really starting to sink in for you? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a tough race for us, but um, yeah, stoked to get the team's championship and the driver's championship. It's just... Uh, yeah, it's been it's been all the uh, hard work that's gone in all, all you know all season, and, and the team you know truly deserves it, and we're you know truly humbled to be here. What does this mean to you, though? I know you've had all night to sweat on the burnout and the celebrations, but being able to come here today and to really show people what you're made of, to be a real champion, just tell us about on a personal level for you what the emotion is in this moment. Yeah, it's very special for me, and um, you know not only just me, a lot of my. Um, you know, cl close family, friends, you know, supporters, they uh, know how much I put into this. So, um, yeah, it's a special one for me and, and um, everyone that's close around me. And uh, I'm uh, very much looking forward to defending that title next year. So, yeah, we'll have a little bit of a break in the off season and, uh, yeah, we'll come back uh, bigger and stronger. Tell us about when the reality of the opportunity that was in front of you really started to sink in this year because coming into season 2023, you'd never actually won a supercars race and you did that back at the Grand Prix this year. When did you know that you could be a champion this year? Uh, probably Taylor and Ben this year when we won all three races, to be honest. But uh, no, I actually believed in the team the whole way through. Um, yeah, we had, you know, glimpses of, um, you know, success there, even, uh, you know, with the old generation of cars. But to be able to fire off so strong at Newcastle, start with the first pole for the Gen 3 era, and, you know, to end it this weekend, um, you know, with the last pole for the year is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, would have been good to get a stronger result, but, uh, yeah, we'll definitely enjoy this tonight. Tell us how the stature and confidence for the team has continued to grow through the season. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been one of those funny ones. Um, you know, a lot of people counted us out halfway through the season. We went through, you know, a bit of a lull period, but, uh, you know, we sort of bounced back, you know, bigger and stronger. And, uh, yeah, we had some really good car speed there and we executed well and, uh, had, had, you know, had awesome pit stops. And, yeah, we really just kept it all together. And, you know, that's why we're here today is, you know, all, all these guys and girls all behind me put in, um, you know, such such enormous hours, um, even, even last night bringing car nine back in just to be in the hunt for the team's championship. So, yeah, awesome weekend for the team and awesome year. When you think back to that first dream you had as a little kid to be a supercars champion, just tell us what it's actually taken to become a champion, to get to this moment. Oh, a lot of bloody hard work, a lot of grease and... Uh, yeah, honestly, it's uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a lot of hard work for myself, and uh, yeah, to get here, it's um, you know, it's an awesome feeling. I'm I'm uh, you know, tr truly humbled to be here, and it's great to be here with so many fans here as well. And uh, yeah, honestly, I'm just uh, you know, you know, looking forward to getting my my teeth stuck in it next year already, and I uh, can't wait to defend this title. Tell us about the team, the, the people that have been really pivotal in this campaign. George Commons, we know you're as thick as thieves. He's ridden you the whole year to get to this point, but also Betty and Daniel, who are there in the background. Barry Ryan, all of the guys and girls at Erebus Motorsport that have made this possible. Yeah, most definitely. It's, um, you know, we've been building this program for, you know, three seasons now. And, and uh, you know, when we first jumped in, and it was my first full-time drive in 2021, a lot of people counted Erebus out, you know, with, with two rookies joining the team. And, you know, it was a pretty big rebuild for a team. Um, you know, Erebus is only small in numbers, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, we just got through it all. And, uh, you know, we've kept the same people around. And, you know, we've really just pushed each other along and, you know, got the most out of each other. And, you know, that's why we're here today is just that trace, that, fa that uh, faith and, and, um, you yeah, know, that, that's the type of stuff you need around you to, you know, breed that success. So, yeah, it's truly awesome to be here. And um, honestly, I can't wait to just uh, celebrate with the whole team tonight. It's going to be awesome. Well, tell us
us about the celebrations. How do you celebrate this one? You have clean swept it this year. Uh, probably a lot of alcohol, to be honest, and uh, a lot of Coca-Cola mixed with a few other products. <laughs> We're covered in it down here. Brody, congratulations on your tenacity on never giving up. You are the 2023 Repco Supercars champion. Woo! Great moment. Lovely interview with Jess. Congratulations, Brody. Coca-Cola Racing and Erebus, well done. But today, our race winner is Matt Payne, home by a whopping eight and a half seconds after a long, hard haul of about an hour and 45 of racing over Brock Feeney, David Reynolds, Cam Waters, Chaz Mostert, and Andre Heimgartner coming home in sixth from Deep Pasquale, Kostecki, who was down the order slightly, didn't have the firepower, as you just said, and then Will Davis and Thomas Randall coming home in our top 10. Last time out for Todd Hazelwood with Blanchard Racing. Last time out for James Courtney at Tickford. Last time out for Scott Pye at Team 18. Last time out for what you're picking up on the theme for Will Brown. So a lot of people on the move and we'll report all of that. We'll bring you a whole lot of new storylines and a lot of energy in 2024. That's to look forward to at the commencement of next year's championship. So points wise, as we wrap it all up this year, at the end of it, home by 323 points in the final analysis for Brody Kostecki over Shane Van Gisbergen had a tough day today as he departs for the US next year. Brock Fee consolidating and holding on in that third spot. Up one spot came Chaz Mostert and down a spot was Will Brown. Teams championship wise, Erebus got the job done. 176 the margin over Red Bull in the end. So they'll have the primary position in the pit lane for the very first race next year. And then we go live pit lane status for the team placement thereafter for a new experiment in 2024. And Brad Jones Racing got it up into third place there as well by virtue of that performance with Andre earlier. BP performance moment here. How good's this one? Unbelievable job. Stephen Grove celebrating at the top of the fence. Matt Payne's awesome drive this afternoon. His consistency for us, it looked like a mistake-free run and his absolute speed was brilliant. Performance moment powered by BP Ultimate and uh, he'll be celebrating well into the night. Now, uh, the top performer. Well, what about this one? Supercars.com ultimate performer thanks to BP Ultimate and the ultimate performers this year were Erebus and Coca-Cola Racing. And that was an ultimate performance because had he gone another 10 millimetres to the left, he would have clouded his own trophy and knocked the plinth down, but he didn't do it. He got away with it. And he's our champion for 2023. That was an unbelievable flick spin that was unbelievably lucky for Brody Kostecki. All right, let's get your grin on and enjoy our final podium of 23. It is time for the podium for race 28 of the Repco Supercars Championship at the Velo Adelaide 500. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please congratulate in third place, car number 26 for Penrite Racing, David Reynolds. In second place, car number 88 for Red Bull Ampole Racing, Brock Feeney. Representing the winning team, Grove Racing, is team owner, Stephen Grove. And ladies and gentlemen, our first place driver, car number 19 for Penright Racing, Matthew Payne. Making the presentation of the third place trophy is the inaugural winner of the Adelaide 500 in 1999, Craig Lowndes. Presenting the second place trophy, the Chief Executive Officer of the Baylow Adelaide 500, Mark Warren. <laughs> Presenting the winning team, the CEO and founder of our major sponsor, Baylo, Aaron Hickman. And presenting the first place trophy to our winner, the Premier of South Australia, the Honourable Peter Melanouskas. <laughs> Making the presentation of the winning laurel is Carolyn Mitchell, the Deputy Chair of the South Australian Motorsport Board.
And now, ladies and gentlemen, our 2023 Repco Supercars Series Trophies. The Dunlop Team's Champion for 2023 for Coca-Cola Racing. Congratulations, Betty and Daniel Clemenko. Coca-Cola Racing by Erebus. And now, the Repco Supercars Champion for 2023 for Coca-Cola Racing by Erebus, Brody Kostecki! <laughs> Making the presentation of the Dunlop Team's Trophy is Kevin Fitzsimmons representing Dunlop. <laughs> and presenting the Repco Supercars Champion Trophy the CEO of Repco, Wayne Bryant. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your race 28 at the Vanlo Adelaide 500 winners and our championship winners, let the celebrations begin! It's going to be a very sweet taste for Matt Payne this afternoon after that wonderful drive where he didn't put a foot wrong for the entire journey. And a one and three there for Penrite Racing in the end. Brock Feeney in the middle. Boost Mobile highlights will take you back to the middle of the afternoon. We had a wild scramble down to turn one. It was very tight down here and on the outside and not blinking and giving up and managing to pop out the other side without a catastrophe. Matt Payne got the lead and then he stuck with it for the balance of the day. More sunshine around in our afternoon today. How was that for a moment as Jack Smith was making his way to the pit lane? And this was a wild move by Brock Feeney down the inside of Brody Kostecki, who then crisscrossed and got back up the other side. There were some very, very high quality exchanges going on out there today, which we thoroughly enjoyed throughout the day. Another beautiful day of hard work and a great result for Brock Feeney today, building off the back of what he achieved here last year as well. Great respect being shown by many competitors as they battled in all the passing zones around here. Passes were cleanly made, continuing to swap out for the miners. But what we did not see, other than perhaps that, was anything in the way of an error. No lock brakes, no sliding cars, no damage hitting other cars. Matt Payne was just able to scoot away. He did a beautiful job today. Steer clear well and truly of all those marbles as well, which was the biggest part of the story. And then just in front of the entire team at the end, he takes the chequered flag. An outstanding drive today by Matt. All congratulations to him. 21 years of age, a very fast young Kiwi, and a new hero is entered into our books.